everyone. Welcome back. Today we have a special guest, an uh, old friend of mine who I've known forever, Carl. Carl, welcome to the show. Thanks, man. Good to see you. Good to see you too, man. It has been like, I know we've, we're have connected through social media, but to actually right. be speaking, it's been years. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's kind of funny how that time passes so quickly. You know, I mean, you think of these lives of touring, these lives of bands and these lives that you have when you're younger and it seemed like it lasted forever, but it was only a couple of years, you know, yeah. and like just that, that time just goes so quick. So quick. yeah, totally. Well, and we've been out of it longer than we, than we were in it at the time, like right. the actual touring <laughs> lifestyle, which is crazy. Right. All right. Before we get too far though, for the uninitiated, for people who wouldn't know, who are you and what do you do? My name is Carl Hensel and I am the president and uh, employee number one of the U.S. office for Kings Road Merch. Um, it was an entertainment merchandise, mostly music merchandise company, mm-hmm. started up by Brett Gerowitz from Epitaph. Uh, we spun off as an independent company in 2011. And so I've just been doing that for 12, coming up on 13 years now, which is really crazy. That's insane, man. Um, how many employees are there now? Ooh, well, it varies because we'll do different like 10 projects and stuff like that. I'd say the consistent number with Germany growing. I'm going to guess 55, 55, roughly. And- so like, you know, between office US, which is usually a pretty consistent number. And then the warehouse holiday, we have four or five extra people. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'd say the average is about 55. So are you the president for only North America or would you be considered like, I know there's two regions, but are you like the worldwide president? Yeah. Yeah. The worldwide so okay. that was that was assigned about 10 years ago. So yeah, it's the full company. Mm-hmm. Isn't that weird to say that you're the worldwide president of anything? It, it, not, nothing. I, I, I still admit it, man. Nothing in my life makes sense. Like it's still, <laughs> it still blows me away of all things that, you know, I mean, one of my favorite bands of all time, especially one of the most important bands of my growing up is Bad Religion. Mm-hmm. And to have this kind of experience where my entire adulthood is shaped by the music I listened to as a kid. And like the guy who wrote and released a lot of these important records are, is just like somebody that I can hit up and ask advice from. Like, it's insane. It's just saying it out loud makes me feel like a jackass sometimes. (laughs) It's just strange. It's really weird, but it's, you know, it's normal now. So just, well, and that's, put your head down and get your work done. Well, that's what's so cool about your story and why I'm so glad we were able to make this work. Cause like, I, I want to get into the whole, how you got there, but just, just to talk about Kings road in general. So um, talk about how the company started and let's go with like how it started. And, and we'll, we'll talk about how you got there later on, but how the company right. started all the way up to this, to it spinning off. I mean, I think the simplest way is that it started. I think the idea kind of came up in 2008, um, you know, as, physical music sales were plummeting, you know, precipitously for all labels and Epitaph had a really strong era and Brett is a really smart businessman. So like he's looking at the marketplace and looking at, you know, this, this dwindling physical establishment. And he was not, he's never been afraid to try new things. He's never been afraid to dabble and and take some risks. And so he realized that online e-commerce had been growing and Epitaph had no footprint whatsoever. Um, the world of major labels and bands he was up against were doing 360 deals. And he wanted to kind of create a counter to that where he wasn't necessarily doing a 360 deal, but he had, you know, a buffet of options. Mm -hmm. So he has a publishing up. He's always done publishing. He added the physical merch side. And um, roughly at the same time, there was a company in Germany, uh, which I'm sure we all know, Trashmark. Mm -hmm. And they were one of the biggest European merchandisers for a long time. And they were starting to get into some, some troublesome situations with debt and a lot of other things that you know have been passed over by the sands of time. And there were some employees looking for a job. So the Europe division of Epitaph hired some of those people to start up Kings Road Europe. And then the US, so it was kind of like there were two independent things, but it was the same idea. And um, he had hired a couple people and they didn't work out and just couldn't get anything off the ground and had different levels of experience. And then uh, it's kind of surreal, but he literally called me out of the blue one day. Um, and there's, there's other facets to the story, but basically like, you know, I was working at bridge nine at the time and, uh, he found out that I wasn't the owner. I wasn't the partner and then hung up and called me back the next day and, uh, offered me a job. He sniped you. 
yeah, I mean, it was, it was one of those things. It was one of the hardest decisions that I've ever had to make. Even now, like there's still moments where I look back on it. It's like, I know I made the right decision, Mm -hmm. but you know, I look back at those times fondly, man. Like those were great. That was a great era of, you know, just personal life, but also professional. And I owe a lot to Chris for Chris from bridge nine for taking the, the chance on me. Like my band had broken up, Martyr AD had broken up. And I knew Chris was looking for somebody. So he took that chance and it, it opened up this other doorway. And, um, you know, I'm still here 13 years later. It's kind of, it's, it, it is what it is, you know? Yeah. Um, well, no, Chris, Chris took the leap. And also you took a leap with him. You know, you put like your, your future in his hands. And I think it paid off for both of you because you did great stuff when you were there. And we'll, we'll get into all that. Yeah. Um, but you took another leap. And of course, Chris being the guy that we know he is, I know he's happy for your for your success and he's gone on yeah i mean we've we've seen each other in person since then and it's it's all it's all fine um you know it was a hard it was a hard transition i think but at the same point in time like uh you know years later it was done fairly and you know we're on we're on good terms and stay in touch so it's all good Oh yeah. All right. So let's go back to the beginnings of King's road yeah. and for anyone who's um, new to the game or hasn't really heard about epitaph records, like epitaph, there's multiple generations of right. people who could say epitaph records was like a huge part of my life, myself, yourself, like the people sitting across from me right now, like, you know, like the footprint of that label is just unimaginable, the band roster. And even though there's a lot of stuff on there that I, I would be like, I wouldn't sit down and listen to um, in later years. It's undeniable about the um, artist focused approach they've had, the business acumen of Brett, like all of those things, really inspirational. Right. So you get this phone call. He's like, hey, come do this thing. You agree. You relocate. Tell yeah. us about day one. What was like day one like when, you, when you're in this brand new business? Uh, it, you know, what the craziest thing was, I knew what I had to get done. So I, I drove out, my wife was five months pregnant. We drove from, we were, she was going to grad school in Memphis at the time. So we drove our moving truck with our dog and five months and her ankles swelling up to the size of, you know, her head pretty much. I mean, it was insane and driving through the desert and it's 95 degrees on the Arizona, you know, Arizona, California border. <laughs> struggling to get up that pass once you cross over from Arizona oh. into California. And so I get out there, I unload everything and, uh, you know, move in. And that first Monday, I still remember the day I was like, all right. Uh, the, the task was to get the web store like really up and running. Cause at that point, all they had done is like little pre-orders here and there. And so it's like, I had to learn what software they were using. It was a proprietary software. So it's like totally different from anything I had done before. And I just went to the warehouse and I got boxes of records and boxes of CDs and started doing data entry and just started filling in the store. Mm-hmm. And then we got to the point where we had enough of the key titles in there. And I was going through the warehouse and it's like, oh, I found 500 Punk and Drubble Look on green or whatever the color was. Oh, I found 500 Suffer on red. Mm-hmm. All these records had been pressed like a year, two, three years before that and just been sitting in the warehouse and nobody had done anything with them. And so in a way, it was almost like I had a cheat code because literally anybody who knew how to use, you know, the most basic internet could have typed catalog number price and Hey, it's punk and drum look. Yeah. Yeah. And that was it. Like, and so the store went bonkers that first weekend. I remember we launched over Labor Day. So I'd gone out there August 3rd. I still remember the day Mm -hmm. and Labor Day was almost exactly a month later. Mm -hmm. And the order volume was so big that it just became an all hands on deck. And there was a bit of an epitaph warehouse staff, um, and they liked the slower store at the time. None of them are with the company anymore. And that was definitely an early lesson, which I'm sure maybe we get to, maybe we don't. But, uh, I just called friends I knew in LA. It was like, I've got a job for three weeks. You know, are you home from tour? Cause I need you to help pack records. And so I was just in the warehouse for about six hours a day. I'd go to the office for six hours a day. We got through that burst and then, um, just went from there. It was really hitting the ground running. And then, improving the software, improving the kind of the way the warehouse flowed. It was very web focused because the company had already lost some money and Brett didn't want to put a ton of money into it. Mm-hmm. And so the, the focus was really building up e-commerce because a lot of the major merge companies didn't really care about e-commerce. It's the hardest segment of the business to do correctly. It's the least profitable because it's got the most hands on deck. It's the most capital intensive, the most time intensive. 
we kind of figured that was where we could kind of carve ourselves out. So once the Epitaph store got going, got a couple other big pre-orders going, um, Converge was an early client, you know, in the process of coming out to California, had some really good conversations with Jake before leaving Massachusetts. And then that led to them coming aboard. Um, Brett had just signed Frank Turner, who I was actually trying to sign at Bridge Nine at the time. And then we almost had him. And then somebody named Brett Gerwitz called him, which is kind of funny. <laughs> so uh, I remember talking to him about it and he's like, it was about a, two months before I got my call. He's like, hey man, sorry, uh, Brett called. What am I supposed to do? Yeah, like, you sign with Brett. Mm-hmm. Like you don't even have to apologize for it. You sign with Brett Gerwitz. Yeah. And uh, obviously that worked out well for him. So he was an early client. So we had enough to kind of keep us busy and keep us out of trouble. trouble. And then, you know, one thing leads to another, you know, and, uh, you know, a couple of years later, got in touch with Bill because I was always at Descendants were always a band that I felt like didn't have a strong presence and they did their own merch for a long time. Mm-hmm. And so I had a couple of really good conversations with him and they came aboard and it's been awesome. So yeah, it's just, it's been really gradual. I would say like outside of those first couple of bursts, there's always been those moments where things are just completely crazy, but it's just been this steady, really steady growth and finding a mistake or finding a problem, fixing it and finding a new one and fixing, it. you know what I mean? That just, it's, you don't notice it at the time. Um, yeah. So very when, similar to growing a band. Well, yeah. And uh, like, actually I, I was going to ask something adjacent to that, but let's get, I want to go back to that e-commerce, e-commerce um, bit, but before we hit that, so when you started, it was just something under Epitaph. It was still like right. Epitaph, but it was like kind of, would you yeah. say like almost like a division of Epitaph? It was. Yeah. yeah. And so it pulled. My email address was carl at epitaph.com. Right. So like all your funding came from like whatever funding Epitaph had, right? Right. Yeah. So it was, it was, it, but it wasn't, there wasn't like a, it was definitely on a, a tight line. I was on a two-year contract and if the business didn't show a pulse, then at least I tried. So, right. but it wasn't, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't a solve a problem with money kind of situation at all. It was, yeah. here's a problem, create the solution. And that was kind of where it fell into place. But I mean, yeah. always had Brad's support. It was never pressure. Like it, he was all, he's always been very patient, very, he's got a very long-term view. So that was never an issue. Mm-hmm. It was always just, you know, fix this and fix this on a, you know, fix this on a little bit more, whatever the, whatever the next step up from shoestring budget is, mm-hmm. um, you know, cause he obviously we had a support, mm-hmm. but I've always kind of been a little cheap and frugal, especially in those early days. So mm-hmm. that party didn't have to worry about. Well, yeah, it's like, if we think, go to the band analogy, it's like, we're well, going to tour the country in a band from the eighties and you're not going to go. The answer isn't you're going to go buy some super nice van. You're going to buy what you hope is a relatively sound band for a very little amount of money, and you're just right. going to make it work across the country. That's what you right. did with Kings Road. In a way, yeah. I mean, it's 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 a little disingenuous because you know Brett's one of the most successful, if not well, actually he's the most successful independent music, you know, label that got the highest selling independent record of all time. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so. It's not like it's just starting out of a bedroom, you know, it's not just like a couple of miscreants creating something out of nowhere, Mm -hmm. but at the same point in time, like it wasn't, you know, an open book, an open checkbook. So it was that way. And, uh, you know, it was started with that way, but having that guidance and having somebody who has been through so much, Mm -hmm. um, you know, it really did. It feels in hindsight, it feels a lot easier than it actually was. Yeah. So how hands off was he uh, in the beginning? Like basically you come and you take this thing over, you have an early success in that first weekend from there. Was he like, was he like, damn, okay, I see some stuff here. I'm going to get involved. Or was it like, yeah, you run this thing. Yeah, no, I mean, it was both. It's both. I okay. mean, he's still involved. Uh, you know, he still jumps when he has time. He still jumps on our, our Monday morning kind of worldwide. What's coming up this week call. Mm-hmm. Um you know, he does similar stuff for Epitaph and that's always going to be his, his number one focus, but he's, he's involved still, especially like when we're doing negotiations for bigger clients, he's got his fingers on the pulse of, of what's going on. Um, but he's always been really trusting and, uh, you know, his, 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 his he's not involved like day to day. He's not like critiquing mocks unless it's for bad religion. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But it's, it's a, uh, it's a little bit more than it's a little bit more than just I've got this company in my portfolio of companies. It's you know he's in there, um, 
occasionally when we're hiring certain positions, he wants to be involved in the hiring process if it's something that is is keen to what he wants to see for the company at a given time. Mm-hmm. Um, so he's in there, he's involved, mm-hmm. you know, but but how much trusting. did he how much did he hand over to you right away? So you had that very first success. After that, was he like kind of prodding you along? Was he giving you advice or was it like, hey kid, you just do this? He was always involved at that early stage for sure. Um, you know, because for the first two years, with three years, really, I was working in the office. I was working in the Epitaph office. So even as we, even as we spun off and did our own thing, I'm still in the building. Like I'm in kind of my own island. We had a little corner where it was like three Kings Road employees just kind of doing our thing, and then Epitaph would do their thing. And occasionally we'd mingle forces on certain stuff. Um, but yeah, I mean, we were in the room, and I was there, and I could always, you know, steal his ear on something. So yeah, he was always he was always involved, and he's. He's got such a good um, instinct, you know what I mean? Even if he hasn't been connected to a particular situation in a long time, he's been through something similar in the last 40 years or more. Yeah. So having somebody where you can just go, hey, you know, here's this messed up situation or here's this great situation or here's this this problem or, you know, think of how many deals he's negotiated. So when it comes to sort of, you know, that natural skill, it's just, it's invaluable. Um, but yeah, definitely. Like, a, I mean, he's his technical title. He's the CEO of Kings Road, and uh, he definitely has that role because it's it's definitely the biggest. He's got his view on the biggest picture, yeah. you know, the biggest of the biggest clients, the biggest mm-hmm. levels. You know. Yeah. So, at what point did you get your first report? Like someone who you were their direct boss. Pretty early on. I mean, actually, the, the first the first report was the guy who didn't succeed at King's Road before me, which those situations <laughs> never go well. Like there's yeah. never, I don't know that there's ever been a situation where somebody's like hired in above another person and it goes swimmingly. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, especially if they're younger. But mm-hmm. you know, I would say like the first probably not too long after that, you know, because mm-hmm. I just there was so many different channels to even get started on, you know, mm-hmm. between I mean it was de- it was definitely employee one in the office and then I was getting a couple people in the warehouse and I was getting a couple more people in the office and then getting a couple more people in the warehouse. And then eventually you have enough people in the warehouse where you got to make a warehouse manager. And then it's just, you kind of get these things all just kind of develop, you know, over time, you know, yeah. and, and in a way it's like having a band where you don't need a booking agent right away, but eventually you'll hit a point where you realize you need one. Totally. And, well, like um, you were like a, in, in a way, like an unintentional business person and an unintentional leader, like you just were like, oh, I'm going to do this. You, it turned into something and you've built it from there. But what did you learn about yourself? Like, you know, what did you, what do you know now about yourself that you didn't know then when you first started this journey? Like, especially like I'm interested in like when you first started getting Kings Road going and you had those early successes, like what did you learn about yourself and what did you learn about business? I mean, the thing I learned man, I, the, the thing I learned about myself was I felt, you know, there's that rare moment when you're in a band and when you're touring and when you're younger. And I feel like a lot of people who've spent a lot of time touring in bands feel this way. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's years of your life. You know, for me, I didn't tour that long relative to others. I mean, I probably put about four years of my life. I was actively trying to be in the band as much as possible. Mm-hmm. Um, about two and a half years of that, I was you know, dictating my work specifically around the goal of trying to be in a band. Um, and you feel like you're, a, you really have a lot of skills, but they don't always apply to the real world. And you feel like, I mean, I did some time in, in business school and college and I realized like, I'm just not like these people. Like I'm just not meant to be middle management at Target or 3M or Best Buy and all the Minneapolis corporations that are always holding recruiting fairs at the University of Minnesota Business School. I just realized like, that's just not who I am. Mm-hmm. Um, but it felt right because i knew that i was i have a pretty tireless work ethic um it gets a little slower the older i get and as the older my kids get but i'm still you know that work ethic and seeing that reward um i felt like that was probably the biggest thing but just seeing like that growth and and knowing like okay well i can't hire somebody to do this job but the job has to get done so i'm gonna learn it you know i'm gonna learn warehouse management system implementation i'm gonna learn how to create picking and pet, put away sequences in a WMS system and outbound flows and all this other stuff that now feels second nature, but there's companies that spend millions of dollars and they can't get their WMS systems working right, you know, on an independent level. And so I think it's just knowing that nothing really can, nothing can really scare me in terms of that. But I also think the most important thing that I learned was 
the value and just admitting right away if you screwed up or not. Yeah. You know, Tell not getting bogged, not getting bogged down. I mean, there's there's a couple very key moments for sure. I mean, it's always simple to be like, oh, be honest, you know, mm-hmm. be honest, everything will work out. Like that's easy to say. But you know, admitting if you screw something up versus anything else, like no one has time for excuses. And even if it's a completely rational reason, it's really understanding like your body of work leading up to that is what's going to get you a forgiveness or not. So, I mean, one, <laughs> one of the most uh, embarrassing moments that I still remember was uh, when Weezer signed to Epitaph, I was on God, either Vinyl Collective or I was still posting on the Bridge Nine board because I was, I, was like, I was a kid still. I was like 27, 28. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I was a fan of music. I have opinions about music. And uh, I posted that once you get, once you work your way through the first song on the record, it's a great record or something to that, that effect. And uh, it got passed to Rivers. Mm-hmm. Oh my God. <laughs> and somebody identified who I was and where I worked and like all this other shit. And so Brett was not happy. Mm-hmm. And uh, I had to get on the phone and I basically was just like, I don't, I told my, I told Jen, I'm like, I don't know if I'm going to still have a job. Like, it was a huge deal for Brett. And that was even like, in my mind is like, it wasn't even a, you know, a German compliment. It was like, <laughs> hey, the first song, you have to get past the first song. The other ones are great. It was, you know, it wasn't like, uh, I don't understand why this record is not good like the other ones. It was, uh, it was you know, while I'm holding the record. But it was just one of those things where I just had to just, power through it and just be honest and I was like I was the whole thing about it was very understandable and I think the next day so I had to go go sleep through that night and the next day I was like stop posting on message boards like, yes sir and you never did it again <laughs> never did it again because <laughs> it's just you know and if I post on anything it's just like keep your opinions to yourself because one you know it doesn't matter and also it's just you know getting that it's just stupid. So that was like, that was a very insignificant moment. I mean, there's things that we've made, we've had mistakes on where, you know, it's one thing if a package doesn't arrive to a band on tour and the track record tracking record shows like it clearly should have been there on time. It's another thing if somebody just didn't make an order and yeah. didn't handle the job the way they should have. And those moments happen, but it is pretty easy to work through them, you know, over time, yeah. you know, it's, that's pretty much it. So you said earlier, e-commerce is like a tough business and there's not a lot of, not like a, it's hard to make money in it. And I gotta tell you, you said that I'm totally surprised by that. I thought like, that's the, that's the spot. So tell us more about that. Well, it's not, it's not that it's the hardest. To, I mean, it's hard. It's, it is the hardest, but mm. you can make money at it. It's just, you got to think that as you get to a certain scale, like if you're running a web store out of your bedroom, Mm-hmm. and you're packing orders yourself and you're getting a couple orders a day mm-hmm. it's something you can just find time to do um and it's not like we don't do anything unique to any other web store you know i, I always joked about that i mean i did a south by southwest panel years ago where it's like anyone can print a shirt and anyone can set up a big cartel now anyone can set up a shopify there's not like some secret sauce to doing this where the challenge comes in is doing it at a scale where it can actually make money like at a real level mm-hmm. um and it's efficiencies, it's keeping, I mean, running a warehouse in LA is not cheap, um, but it's also where we're based for our warehouse and same thing in Germany. And uh, getting to a point where you can handle, like if you had to, you could pull your friends together and pack 300 orders in a day. Well, you got to get, what if you have 300 the next day? And what if you have 300 the next day? And what if you have 300 the next day? Oh, and then some of those packages don't show up. Some of those packages get lost. Some of the packages get destroyed. Now you got to handle customer service. Now you've got orders coming in, orders going up. Oh, we got to get a pre-order up. Uh, stock isn't going to be here for two months. You got to administer that differently than anything just like your normal ones and twos. And the, the reality of running a warehouse is that it costs every time somebody's hand touches a product or a shirt or a box, it costs you money. And you got to think about how do you do that in a way that's fair, that makes you know, employees want to show up and feel like they're not just you know, grinding out in an Amazon warehouse, but there's actually like a place they can go. And then also at the same point in time, you have a sustainable future. And it's just the web store, the web store hosting costs money. There's a lot of little things like every shirt on the shelf that hasn't sold yet, you pay for. So you got to make sure you're not over-ordering. Um, and that's a lot of companies have that problem, just like over-ordering inventory or not manage those different ebbs and flows because 
within our warehouse, we have three different types of businesses. You know, you have your ones and twos of web store, you have your dozens of wholesale orders, you know, where you could have 300 items in an order and one or two of them per SKU, you know, shirt and size. So it's just a lot of different stops in a warehouse. And then you have tour orders, which are, you know, cases of similar designs and uh, they all require different strategies. So it's the focus for a lot of the major merch companies was always touring Mm -hmm. because it's the same amount of work to pull a box of a hundred shirts off the shelf as it is to pull that single shirt out of a box. Mm -hmm. You know, that person's going to that location, just a matter of how many of them do they take with them. So how did you figure out how to scale then effectively so that it was a profitable business? Trial and error. I mean, just continually looking at that, continually trying to avoid, you know, and you learn from it, you know, there's years where we were, we weren't profitable, but we weren't hemorrhaging money. Mm -hmm. And so it's just a matter of like figuring out how do you turn that in? And there's some places that, that a lot of the the merchandise companies out there, like the actual like bigger ones, you know, the, the major label type places, the web store for a lot of those places is marketing. It's, it's an online presence and it's, it's just a lot of work. And I think for us, like just kind of, once we figured out, you know, the scale to kind of make it where it makes sense, um, it's just keeping that, keeping an eye on that all the time, never, you know, keeping staffing in check. Uh, because the other point of it is that we've always paid ahead of minimum wage in LA. And so it's a little bit harder now because the minimum wage increases, but in the early days, like we were always 20, 25% above minimum wage. So if you were a kid and, you know, you are more interested in like skateboarding and music than getting a real job. Like we can give you a job that actually gives you benefits and pays fairly compared to like working at a restaurant or something where some of those places won't pay you fairly and uh, keeping that going. And just, it's just, it's, it is tireless. It's never ending. It really is like a never ending analysis. I mean, it's something we look at that quarterly and, and we look at it sometimes monthly and we still do, you know, even to this day where we know, it's automated to a lot of ways. We know we're kind of in a comfortable spot. We're still always looking at it to make sure nothing sneaks up on us. Yeah, I'm interested. So you got this thing that comes from punk. It is punk. And it's also a real business. Um, Have you ever had those moments where you're like, as a punk, I don't want to do this? Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Um, there, There were moments where uh, there's, there's been some times, I mean, in a lot of ways, it's almost self-selecting, um, because the clients that we'll talk to are just naturally going to come from our ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Um, and then there's other, there's other times where it's like, you know, music snobbery is not, I, I want to work with a band where I at least understand what their fans want. And in some cases, like, you know, one of our biggest clients and one of our longer running clients is Papa Roach. And I knew them from their hits, you know, I knew them as that active, you know, that big rock radio band from the early 2000s. And I, that's all I knew about them. Um, wasn't a thing that I listened to. It wasn't a thing that was on my radar. And when we started talking to them, you know, you realize like these guys are from the same worlds as we are, you know, and they're like small town dudes that were into heavy music for them. They were into corn, just like they were into refuse. They were into mm-hmm. Deftones, just like they were into Snapcase. They were into Earth Crisis, just like they were into you know something else that would be in the new metal world. Mm-hmm. To them, it was just heavy music. Yeah. And so, and then the drummer was in Ten Foot Pole and Scared Straight. Mm-hmm. And so, like you start realizing, like this, they're, 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 they're all on the same page. Yeah. You know what I mean? And then that gives you a different perspective because you realize it's like these guys have created like a they're a big rock band still, mm-hmm. and they've been through a ton of crap. They've been through like ups and downs as a band. They've gone from having a multi-platinum record to having venues 30% full. You know, they've been through these kind of these waves of a band and you realize like they're not from a different world. So those are the moments where like my music snobbery in my early life, I would be like, nah, fuck that. They're not a punk band. They're not a hardcore band. I'm not doing that. But then you realize like, not, not, not for nothing, like, they're one of my favorite bands to work with because they are very genuinely great people. And so you get to those moments where it's not just, you got to think about it from a bigger, bigger perspective. If you want to be working with, if you want to keep doing this and you want to, like I would say, if you want to stay outside of the real world, you know, there are limits, but we haven't ever had a moment where it's like, 
I mean, there, you know, there's never been a moment where it's like, oh, you, we've had moments where clients have said some borderline sketchy stuff and we had them clarify it. Like, what did you mean? You know, make a public statement, please make a, and like management was on board and it happened, but it's also, that stuff gets lost in interpretation sometimes. And I think it's also, like we've never had a moment where it's like, we would never work with anybody who's like openly racist or openly, you know, this for lack of a better comparison, fascist. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, just that's the all encompassing term of it all. Mm-hmm. Um, that's never come up. Mm-hmm. That's never been a thing. And if it ever, if it had anybody on our roster had ever done that, I'm like, peace, you know, yeah, see ya. Yeah, totally. Like, Without a doubt. It's just not worth it. It's not, not only is it not worth it, business wise it's not something that we would ever want to be a part with be a part of or be associated with well i mean you guys are are still like punks like you're like real like you know real punks like i mean obviously obviously i know i think anyone listening to this would know where your um your your politics lie for sure with all right but i want to i want to go to that because you went to the question like you answered the question that i was interested in is like hey it's like (sighs) not just punks, but I'd say anyone who's kind of like steeped in subculture and they go into the business world and whether intentionally or unintentionally. So even say like a successful artist or a successful skateboarder, um, anyone who's steeped in subculture, but then gets into like business business. And that's just a part of your world. There's like that rare kind of person who can just perfectly walk that line where they do only what they want to do in only the way, the way they want to do it. That's pretty rare. Otherwise, I just find there's so many people who are like, oh, I thought that was lame. And then like, I really like thought about it and I learned about it and I realized, oh, like I'm just being a jerk. I'm just being a snob. And like, actually that's cool. Like I might not like their skateboarding or I might not like their art or I might not like their music or their magazine, but like what they've done with it is actually comparable to what I'm doing. And that's super cool. And that like, I don't just see that from people coming from subculture, I see it from people coming to the business world in general, like these ways that we compartmentalize, not, and I'm not talking about ethical things, the way that we compartmentalize, like what's cool, what has taste, and the way that can be this like really limiting factor. Can I give you an example about what I do? Yeah. Um, you know, very often, and I, I kind of laugh at this, is like people are like, I don't even know what you do. It's like, man, how do you not know what I do? Like we've known each other for like X amount of years, however many years, not you and me, but like people that right. like, I, I, I see day to day. And if I tell people what I do, I'm like, I'm essentially just a therapist that works in the business world. I built up a company around me where we go and do coaching, we do training. And the thing that I hear from people very often is like, wow, you, you know, you cut your teeth in, in the not-for-profit and you're working in the corporate sector. Like, doesn't that kind of suck your soul? And I was like, hell no. It's like, awesome they need someone like like me and the team that i've built up to work in there like we're helping people and we're doing cool things and we're helping business be better and i always get kind of stuck in that idea of like limiting yourself when you're kind of like in this little scene which is cool it's like it's us against them like you know our form of hardcore is cooler than your form of hardcore our 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 local scene is cooler than your local scene oh people from there they're they're posers like whatever but when you get to a point where you're like trying to build something and really build it, if those walls don't come down, it's very likely that like your ability to do things on a cool, meaningful level is going to be highly restrained. So I think it's sick that you, that you um, have Papa Roach on there. That's awesome. Yeah. And I mean, it's, I mean, the other, the other tangent to that, that's kind of funny is that their, their main accountant, you know, their business manager mm-hmm. is Jonas, who was in Harvest and HopeCon. And that's so right. yeah, yeah. Like he's their head accountant. And so we always joke about, cause he grew up in Minneapolis mm-hmm. and it's like, who'd have thought, man, cause they're Papa Roach just had a new record come out and we were talking about it. And it was just like, who'd have thought we'd be sitting here. And you know, it's like that Paul Rudd meme that flies around. Mm-hmm. And it's just the, the world of one, just like where you grow up, that somebody you would deal with professionally is still here. But then also just like, not only do we have them as a client, but it's like we both, really love working for them and like appreciate what they're doing and appreciate the fact that they're willing to take risks musically and just like all these things are just like I can't believe that you know our prior hardcore elitism is here and it's like a genuine expression between two friends talking about how much we love Papa Roach and no. uh, <laughs> you know like forget the forget the business the business motives like mm-hmm. Papa Roach could say they want to fire me and they'd be fine and I'd be fine you know uh-huh. once you get past like oh man that sucks but like if if it's just one of those things, the older you get, it's, there's only your world of what, what is cool 
isn't cool to kids that are your who you know in your age demographic 20 years ago so like kids that are in their 20s now they won't think stuff that we thought was cool 20 years ago is cool some of them do but it's just a different world you know that times pass things change and i i'm sorry i feel that more now than i have you know previously but and I, it's that's why like working with somebody like brett's so inspiring because he has never really locked into that he got out of that mindset really early um you know especially after that first kind of you know the big boom he definitely started taking chances and you know you can see it you can see when he started signing you know signing motion city soundtrack and signing some of these other bands that were like those guys come from a similar world peripheral to the punk scene but that isn't a no effects bad religion you know rancid tour tour partner um you know, years later, you know, maybe on Warped Tour, but he's signing different stuff, you know, signing stuff that, you know, people will be like, that's not punk. Why are you signing that? That's not punk. But, you know, I mean, even all the, a lot of the emo rap stuff that he's been signing, he's like, you go to those shows, he's like, it's not for me as a person, but he's like, the kids going to those shows are going to shows for the same reason why punk and hardcore kids went to shows when we were younger. 100%. They're just looking for a place. They're looking for something that they can connect with other people. They mm-hmm. feel different from the world and they found a place where they don't feel as different. That's mm-hmm. all it is. And so it's facilitating that and creating that and also understanding that, I mean, look, man, some of those punk and hardcore bands we liked when we were younger, they kind of sucked. Like some of them are bad musicians. I'm not going <laughs> to name any of them because I learned my lesson, but <laughs> One right here, I mean, right you now. guys could at least like play on time and play guitars that are tuned. <laughs> you know, we're talking like, I'm, I'm talking the bar that I'm talking about <laughs> is so much lower than what anything you ever did. You're a pretty good guitar player. So you don't have to go down that road. <laughs> but like you, you think about it when you're listening to stuff, it's like there's bands out there where it's like the idea is just as important as the music. You Dude, know what I mean? Totally. Totally. And, and so, like, oh, go ahead. No, just saying, like, you get into these bands, it's like some of these bands, you like the idea of a band like mm-hmm. that more than, like, the lyrics and the content hitting you. Um, totally. Well, and, like, I can't believe I'm saying this. To go back to Papa Roach, uh, right. <laughs> like, I remember when they were, like, the big record they were on, whatever it was. I believe one of their guys in the band, like, I made their original bass player was Straight Edge. Like, they had a kid in, like, I, that. I think so. I think that I think you could be right. Maybe back in the time, I've never asked them. They had um, they had some kind of connection. There was someone who was somehow connected to them that like literally came from like the hardcore scene or had some kind of like was was in the know. And right. I never forgot that because I like you know you're young, you're kind of like oh I was being said blah 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 blah. Right. But many well a few years ago, let's say I guess it's about 2015. I was in uh, I was in Las Vegas with uh, a bunch of friends uh, as Chris Williams and his partner and my partner yeah. at the time. And, and um, it might've been 2014. I can't remember. It was new year's. We, de- we all decided, which is strange, bizarro, a bunch of straight edge people. Kids. Let's go <laughs> to Las Vegas for new year's. And we're there and we're just kind of walking through old Vegas and we come across a free outdoor, out- outdoor live show and it's Papa Roach. And like, nice. I, we're just like, kind of like, you know, Oh yeah. Like we'll watch it. It's kind of thinking like we're being corny, man. We all, and it was funny because like our feet are tapping, our heads are, you're looking at right. each other's side eyes. And then we realized we all knew all the lyrics to all of their hit songs. And <laughs> by the time, it's crazy. They, by the time they played Last Resort, we were like full on having a great time. We're singing, we're dancing. Some lady with like a cigarette, like started waltzing with me. It was like one of the funnest nights of my life. And it's just funny how like, not just punks, because I don't want to just say that, but like if you get too steeped in any any kind of culture, go and then you go into the real world. It's like, damn, like you're missing all these cool opportunities that you can still see things through the eyes of culture and through the eyes right. of, let's say, business school or the things that you've done. But if you don't open your ear, if you can see it through the eyes of that, but if you don't open your mind to experiences, then you're just living in this walled off little place. And I think it's just such a shame because there's so many cool experiences you could have. And, and that's why I like, I, I love your story about Kings Road. And I think that Papa Roach uh, example is absolutely perfect. Um, I do want to, um, uh, I do want to ask you um, one of the, when you talked about like new bands that Epitaph was signing, yeah. I, one that stood out to me at the time was Bring Me the Horizon. Right. And I, I can literally remember sitting in front of my friend's computer because I didn't own a computer at the time and looking at the computer and be like, bring me the horizon. What is this 
this is terrible. And they've gone on to do all of this totally crazy stuff. But Brett had a way, and I imagine still has a way of seeing around the corner of what will be and then investing in that and then bringing everyone along for a ride and bringing the culture along for the ride. For me, that's not just smart business. That's like that's like community building. That's like creating a, creating a home where good business can be done and you can have like a good creative presence. I, I think it's like, in retrospect, I laugh at how judgmental I was. Yeah, I mean, I think it's also, it's one of those things where, you know, you were talking earlier about, you know, most of my music business world can be traced. I mean, it can, you can trace everything back multiple mm-hmm. steps if you wanted to. But I would say that on the actual functional business level, it was really when I was in Martyr AD. I mean, a little bit, there's a little bit of holding on stuff. I mean, actually like one of the things that I still vividly remember was we knew we were breaking up on our last tour. And I, we were in Boston at the the office right by Fenway. And I sat down there with Chris and I was like, hey, how much money do we owe you? And whatever it was like $2,000 or 2,500 bucks or whatever. And I put the money on the table. So I'm like, all right, we're good. We're level, like we're breaking up. And I just never wanted to have anybody stuck with debt on our behalf. And those little moments trace back, you know, it's like those, that moment I guarantee is why when I stuck my neck up for the job at Bridge Nine, I knew I at least had some credibility with Chris. Mm -hmm. And uh, because we weren't one of the bigger bands on the label, Mm -hmm. but I wasn't just going to stick him with the stick him with a negative when it came to our name. And as those moments kind of come through, you realize like all those bands had that same experience. Mm -hmm. You know, there's not a band that's peripheral to our world. There's very few situations where they just jump right out of the gate and they're off and running. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, you know, I mean, Bring Me the Horizon, their first tour manager, when they started to become a really big band, was Sheep. And he booked a lot of shows in Leeds and booked, like I stayed in his apartment and I'm still in touch with him. I went and saw him a couple of weeks ago when he was in town with another artist that he's tour managing. Mm -hmm. And it's just, you realize like, all those, I mean, Brim of the Horizon took out bands. Architects did the same thing when they were in their early days, like that band Dead Swans that we signed when I was at Bridge Nine. Like those guys were all touring together. They were all friends. And they were all from, you know, like Dead Swans was a little more in the American nightmare and, and kind of carry on influence of that world. And Brim of the Horizon and Architects definitely weren't, but they were all kind of coming from the same mindset. Yeah. And Parkway Drive is the same way. And I think just those kind of moments where, Brett recognizes stuff. He doesn't think it's going to become like, I don't think going back when he signed Parkway Drive and when he signed Architects, I don't think he expected them to be at the levels they're at now. I could be wrong. I don't want to speak for him. I think every band wants to be at that level, whether or not they get there or even want to get there is a different discussion. Um, But I think that he sees those things and he sees certain aspects of, of creation and just goes, Hey, this needs an outlet. This needs a place. And I can be that place and I want to facilitate that place. And so many bands are loyal to that. You know, I mean, that's why, I mean, Parkway architects, like those bands are so big, you know, bring me, bring me did end up signing to a major and it succeeded very much, but like they still have a gold record on Epitaph. Mm -hmm. Um, And some of those other bands just stay with them because they knew who they were at the time. Brett saw something in them and there's a loyalty there. And I think that's one of the, one of the more important business aspects is like, I've had it personally happen with me and I've taken it from him and I've always made sure to carry it forward, which is just like, if you say you're going to do something, follow through on it, period. It's so easy. And he's always done that with his bands. He did that with me, you know, from day one, you know, he said when he laid out like where he thought things could go, every time we hit that plateau, he was on the next step and he followed through on what he said. And, you know, that, that goes a long way and it, it, it gives you that those businesses that last for decades and decades oh yeah well so i'm a big believer obviously i'm a coach and i run a coaching firm so i'm a big believer in coaching but i'm also a huge believer in mentorship and one of the things that i try and do with the people i work with uh, the people that, I, that work in the company is i just try and give them like practical mentoring on things uh, that I didn't have when I was coming up. So when I was coming up as a therapist, I had almost exclusively bad bosses. And like some of them were bad bosses just because they like, you know, they're just, you're working the social services. You're kind of being pulled 8,000 ways. They just didn't have time or the focus. Some of them were bad bosses because they were like terrible, like just clownishly bad bosses. So when I, when I entered into like the pure business world, I didn't really have like a mentor and I didn't really have I never really been coached or have mentor, uh, had a mentor or anything. And as I've gotten older, 
I seek out people to teach me things and to help me grow as a leader. And like, you know, I'll, we'll bring in consultants to help our company grow. We have one right now who's like helping me a lot with just business development stuff. So when I think about like mentorship and how important that is, I'm interested in like, it sounds like you and Brett have had a pretty close relationship. And this is really a conversation about you, not about, not about him, but right. what's it been like having for your development? What's it been like having someone like that to guide you through, um, I mean, through your career? It's, it, you can't put up, you can't put, it's hard to put words to it. Mm -hmm. um, it really is. I mean, it's just like, it's, it is a, I mean, I appreciate it. I tell them every so often, you know, mm -hmm. it's not even something I take for granted. I think it's allowed me to do similar things. You know, I, it's definitely in my head when we have different situations with employees or different kind of things. I ask myself, like, what what would Brett say in this moment? You know what I mean? And uh, keeping a level head in those moments, good or bad. You know, don't celebrate. It's it's like coaching, like like sports coaching. Like, don't celebrate too long, and don't beat yourself up for too long. And uh, you know, I think that those kind of those kind of moments are are key. And it's allowed me, I mean, a way, you know, watching how, I mean, he's had some employees that have been with him since the very, very beginning. I mean, Jeff wears Birkenstocks is an Epitaph employee from the No Effect song, and he still works there. You know, he was the first employee, he's still there. And uh, I mean, he's been with him now for what, 30 something years. So there's a certain level of that, which is just sort of, I want to make sure that we have that longevity. I want to make sure we have that kind of loyalty. And we have we have a lot of people that have worked with Kings Run from the early days. I mean, our head account started, came out for customer service. You know, band broke up, wanted to move to LA, started in customer service. We didn't have a lot of money, but there was a period where, because our warehouse of where it was located, we could actually pay for him to go get his accounting degree from UCLA and finish that up. And it was cheaper than if we would have given him that money as a paycheck. And he saw that and he's still with us. Um, and so, you know, key people started out in the warehouse. Now they're, you know, the head of our, our artist relations and project management teams, he started out in the warehouse and he comes from the band world. He worked at labels, like he's done a bunch of stuff, but you realize like having that experience working at labels, especially independent labels, you're not getting paid that much. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, working in a mail order warehouse really isn't much of a step down from working at an independent record label in a lot of cases. And as those things have grown, you know, people see that and they go through those moments and they have people within the company have people that can teach them, you know, and it's a really key thing to have different levels of experience, but it all comes from, you know, maybe they're not having the same one-on-one -on -one conversation with Brett, but I think like creating that, it's hard to create a culture like, you know, in our warehouse, we had a really hard time creating a really positive um, culture. Like there was a lot of, you know, a lot of it starts out where like, people are just like giving each other a hard time and, and cracking jokes and, and, you know, it's like being in a van mm -hmm. where people are just kind of like, it becomes one day the joke isn't funny anymore. And you never know when that day is going to come. Mm -hmm. And that just kind of creates this, you know, it creates a world where, you know, maybe somebody's not working as hard and they're not, no one's coming down on them. Nobody's like speaking to them. They just kind of exist. Mm -hmm. And that kind of rotates and creates a similar kind of world. So mm -hmm. getting, getting, I've watched turning cultures around mm -hmm. and it's tough it's hard. It takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of patience and uh, understanding that it's a long-term, a long-term project. Um, you know, those, those kind of things get handed down, but now, you know, our warehouse manager started out one of our first warehouse employees and he wasn't one of our best warehouse employees and he'll be the first to say it. And, uh, but once he saw the company growing and he saw the warehouse manager that we had one of our first ones, not really doing a great job and kind of leaning on him, um, and he had a kid on the way, he really changed how he was operating, changed how he, he carried himself. And he's absolutely an integral part of our team now. Um, and so creating that world where people know, not only is it, there's a patience to things, people never get fired for mistakes. Like a single mistake will never get you fired. Mm -hmm. And making sure people don't feel like they're afraid of their jobs is a very key thing. And all that, it all rotates around each other, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I wanted to ask you, you brought up something about kind of like being the person in the van who gets picked on, you know, and I like some of the things that I look back on, like there's not a lot of things I regret in my life, but there's things I look back on. It's like, you know what it's like, 
you're in a van and you're in a van for weeks and weeks. And there's that one person who does that goddamn thing over the time. And they just, everyone starts clowning on them. And I'll never forget. There's two guys that I always think of. I'll leave their names out of it. Now the first like ever real North American tour uh, I ever did. This one dude just got picked on mercilessly. And it was my band. And I was like, you know, the band dad, that was like the, the head of the band, I guess you'd say. Right. And even though everyone was picking on him, it was really my fault. It was really on me. I could have stopped it. And if anything, I was kind of like the instigator because, you know, you're a bunch of like guys being together. You got that weird toxic thing going on. Right. Right. And at the time, I remember thinking like, I lost a friend over that. And like, we're still, we've never been cool since. I mean, it's been like 20 years. We've never been cool. And, right. and I, don't, I don't blame him. But I had another friend who were, we're, we're friends now, but like we we're, it was like my first band that did a ton of like real deal touring and we were in Europe for the first time. And you could just see, we were just picking on this guy mercilessly. And of course, like we're like in a band, so we think it's okay, right? Like you think it's right. okay, but then you, you're just thinking like, God, the mental health impact of getting into this space with people who are picking on you all day. And one day this, this guy who is, you know, like a very successful business person himself now and, uh, and a great person, uh, he looked at all of us and from like the depth of his soul, he meant this. He was like, you're bad people. And we were like, oh my God. And we actually started laughing. But like, I'll never forget that. Cause I, like, I thought about it later on that night and he quit the band. And I thought of it later on that night. I was like, you know, he's right. Like we're, we're, we're good people, but because of the environment that we are part of, but we also, that we were creating, we were being horrible to this guy. And those two people really like, I, I carry that a lot and and I think about it a lot. I regret it a lot. The reason I'm talking about this is like there's a bunch of stuff that you learn from punk that help you do things, right? Like, oh, I learned how to, you know, build up a business on a shoestring. I learned how to like kind of like make things work. I learned how to problem solve. But there's the flip side where like, and I don't want to just say this about punk, but like traveling around, touring, you can have like such a toxic culture within a group of people. But it's different when you have a company and you know how it can yeah. be in the end. So what did you learn from that, from that kind of toxic culture that can happen? What did you learn about that that helps you prevent it happening at King's Road? I mean, it's, I, I, I've said this multiple times and I feel like the, the challenge of this is leaving band names out of this because I think some of that is, it is relevant to the people that I want to, I want I to shout out to. Yeah, yeah. Uh, all positive, I think. Mm-hmm. But it's, I think one of the best teachers in business is being in a toxic band. Mm. I really do because you have just enough of an experience of momentum, right? You've, you've seen something grow and not even, I mean, I remember my first band, like we were on tour with My Life is War and it was before um, I Love My Way had come out. We, we knew that was going to be our last tour. We hadn't made it like public, mm. but man, you watch those guys from, I mean, from their first note, we played their first show. It was just like, there's something different. Like whatever we wanted to have, they have, mm-hmm. and whatever they have is going to, that's what needs to be out in the world. Like we couldn't create that. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's not like, Oh man, they made us break up. It's like, no, you just recognize like what we did was great. What we did was fun. We got to meet a ton of people. Mm-hmm. We had a, like very fond memories of those eras and that, that time. And it, it's all, it's all good. You learn a lot from that, you know, in, in life, but in terms of the business lessons, it's like understanding like, okay, no matter how good you think you are, someone can do it better. Mm-hmm. And that's, that to me is like one of the most important lessons. And also no matter how good you think you are, you didn't do it perfect. Mm-hmm. And, and a lot of people live in a world where they like, they don't like hearing that. They don't like hearing criticism. And um, I think one of the things that I learned the most is, is understanding when there's a problem and I still do it to this day and I'm pretty proud of it, but it's like, when there's a problem, I never ask like, why didn't you do this? Hmm. It's never, it's always like, I always try to come up with what is, what could be done differently, Hmm. you know, top down. Hmm. And so, I mean, even to this day, we're doing it, you know, between older orders that have shipped partially in our warehouse, something as small as that, you know, where multiple people have their eyes on it, but you realize like, well, we could be doing this better. You know, I know our shipping stats. I know how accurate and how on time our shipping stats are. But when I see somebody who's in, like, I know for a fact, 99 and percent of our orders are shipped totally fine. 
on time, barring COVID uh, and other d- supply delays. But, but I know everything is shipped accurately on time, 99.5% of the time. I know that. But when you're doing so many orders, that half percent, they're not lying. You know what I mean? Now, some of those, some of them are, you know, kind of delusional, but there are some people who have very valid things. Like if you email our company and we screwed something up, they'd be like, well, like, how can we make this better? Like, you're totally right. We sucked at this one time. Like we need to fix this. And I take that personally. And I do that in my own daily life. Like, how can I fix something or how can we fix something collectively? And it's not like, why did you screw up? Why didn't you do better? You know, there's no, nobody likes that. Nobody gains from that. And there's no positivity that comes from it. Mm-hmm. And it's just like always being aware of the fact that admitting you're never perfect, but you do things pretty damn well. And, you know, there's going to be somebody that can do it better. So make sure you don't get complacent. And it all comes from being in bands, you know, being in a band and wanting to look at it like, oh, I wish we were at that level. And then you get to that level and you realize like, oh, it's not actually that great here. I'm going to be at that level. Well, mm-hmm. You know, it's different in, in business for sure. Uh, there's less variables that way, but that same kind of thing of just, you know, if you set a goal and you get to it, what's your next one? You know? Totally. Well, I think of, <clears throat> I think a lot of business stuff and being a business owner, I think about it a lot like playing shows or like a skate competition or um, a painting that someone's uh, painting. You're only as good as your last success. And like every right. time you play, you're earning your spot. Like every time you you're in a skate competition, you're earning your spot. Every time you paint, you're earning the eyes that are going to be on the painting and like the positive reviews or the positive impressions you have. And I don't say that from a place of like, people should be anxious about it. But like, I think the idea of complacency is like, oh yeah, like I'll just tuck into this and go, cool. That's great. You've, you've found where you're employed, but that's not like your job. You know, like your job, when I think of a job, I think of like, what's, what am I here for? What's my purpose? Like, what am I, like, I didn't, I didn't really know what my purpose was like deeply until I started this company. Now it's like, oh, every day I know what I'm doing. It's like, my purpose is to be a father. My purpose is to be like a helper. My purpose is to be a a good business owner, run a good business, have like practical things that help people, but have like, you're kind to your employees. Up until that point, I was just doing jobs, you know, or or like, um, like, uh, yeah, I was just doing jobs. I was just filling up space. But then when I found my purpose, it was just a totally different thing. And it makes me every day want to earn my spot. So like when I was playing in bands a lot, you know, I loved playing with bands that were better bands than us that had a crazy live show that were like, totally would blow us out of the water unless we totally brought it because I fully believe you have to earn your spot in all things all the time. And that's like, I don't know, that's like the churn of life. That's interesting because you got to you got to bring your A game into things. Right. And I think I mean, for me, the I've been very, very lucky in my adult life because the only I mean, even when I was in bands. I was working at Radio Shack selling cell phones and I spoke Spanish pretty fluently. And so like, I enjoyed that as much as one could enjoy working at Radio Shack, but I was always just keeping my eyes on trying to be in a band. So there was always that other distraction. So I never really thought about that. That was just a means to an end. But as I, as the band world wrapped up, you know, pretty quickly, I, I wanted to be involved in music somehow. I just didn't know how, I mean, I was like turning 24, I was young. You know, in the grand scheme of things, I was really young to, to be in that crossroads. And there were some opportunities to tour in bands, but I just realized, like, I don't know that I'm cut out for that long term. And so having that um, purpose, you know, my purpose working at Bridge Nine was very clear the whole time. Like, I always had something that I could, you know, tangibly connect with. And same thing, you know, from King's Road day one, like, I, I've never had a slow day mm-hmm. since I started, like, not once. Sometimes it's been a little too busy, you know, but those moments are appreciated in hindsight. You know, it's, it's fun. Now I can talk about how my appendix was triple the size of a normal appendix. And I was working 18 hour days uh, because we had to fire five people in the warehouse and the orders had to get picked. And uh, you know, now it's funny at the time it wasn't, but it's just those kind of things you, you course your way through and, and mm-hmm. finding that, that purpose. And now my purpose to me, you know, being my age and still working with bands that I was either friends with when I was younger or bands that I grew up listening to or bands that I appreciated before we started working with them. It's like a lot of them are older. A lot of them have families, they have other businesses that they're invested in, but this is their main thing. 
And it really is just like recognizing you're still out there. No matter how glamorous your tour is, there's going to be some dirty, gross situation and something goes off the tracks in ways that all of us can relate to. Um, you know, whether it's bags go missing from the airport or whether it's the the trailer on the bus blows a tire. It's not the van trailer that blows a tire, but the bus trailer blows a tire and you're still in the middle of North Carolina, whether you like it or not. And you're away from your kids. And, oh, this bill came in. It's more expensive to do this than we thought. Gas went up from the time, you know, remember those days? I know you were touring then when gas went from like two bucks a gallon to four bucks a gallon in California really quickly. And so you just have these moments of surprises and that level of band, I just want to make sure that I'm doing everything I can mm -hmm. so that they continue to move on and keep going. And not necessarily like I'm not like sacrificing myself. I'm not creating myself as a martyr, mm -hmm. but it's recognizing what it takes to get there. And really what it takes, like even for bands that are playing, you know, two to 3000 people a night, mm -hmm. recognizing what sacrifices that takes to be out there. You know, they're not at home. They're not sleeping in their own bed. They're not with their families. Yeah. They're on a bus. Sleeping on a bus isn't exactly comfortable. Mm -hmm. living in a living in a bus with 12 other people isn't private you know you're not getting a lot of downtime mm -hmm. and just making sure like when i'm around that world i want to make the tour manager's life as easy as possible because i know what they're giving up you know i want the tour managers to like me and to never talk to me because if the tour manager has to talk to me something went wrong right, and right. so it's to me that 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 is a purpose because mm -hmm. they're going to be out there doing this whether i'm doing my job or not somebody's going to be doing what I do in this world for their band, whether it's me or someone else. And so just recognizing, like, I don't take any of that for granted when I see bands on, on tour and I see, you know, you, you people have this misconception of what being on tour is and it's not Motley Crue the dirt, you know, maybe there's some bands that live that way still, but it's a lot of Theraguns now and it's a lot of yoga mats and stretching and it's a lot of people who are just, you know, <laughs> trying to preserve their bodies so that they can keep doing this, you know? Yeah, and, yeah, totally. and I don't, I think that to me is, it's not, I'm not changing the world doing what we're doing. Like we're not making, I don't think we're making the world a worse place, mm -hmm. but I don't think we're like creating some sort of, you know, benevolent future by any means, but we're creating a way for bands to exist, for people to support their bands and doing it in an honest way. And that's, that to me is just as good because it's like, I can still sit here and wear a descendant shirt to work and feel like I'm, you know, I'm dressing up for the part. Yeah, know? man. Well, you're and I, that, that part's fun. Like that part's yeah. awesome. And I don't, yeah. you know, I got friends who, you know, they have really successful jobs, but it's still kind of funny that, you know, we're still here. So, yeah. um, all right, let's pull it back to, uh, to your early days. So you grew up in Minneapolis. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. So how did you find punk and hardcore in the first place? I mean, I think it just, I was into aggressive music from an early age, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. I remember, uh, I'm gonna date myself, but I hadn't yet started fourth grade when the Black Album came out. So the year of the Black Album, The Illusions, Nevermind, all those records kind of coming out in that same bubble, I was in fourth grade. So I remember, and I remember going to get, I remember the Black Album being like, I gotta get this. So that was like on my radar as a thing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I think back now, it's kind of funny that I was in a after school daycare program at the community center and the main teacher there would let me listen to Guns N' Roses Appetite for Destruction during quiet time, which <laughs> in hindsight, I'm like, I think that's pretty awesome. But as a parent now, I'm like, I mean, they, there's things I didn't understand until later in life. Right. Uh, and that record still rules. But it's just kind of funny to think about a, a second grader getting to listen to that record at the suggestion of a teacher. It's, wow. you know, only in the 80s. You know what I mean? Different but, time, uh, man. Different, different times. Um, but it also has created, I don't want to be a hypocrite. So I make sure my kids know, like, there's a time and place for certain words. And so this isn't the time and place for them. But like, not necessarily censorship. But, uh, you know, and th those are formidable moments. Mm -hmm. um, but then what do I find? You find Slayer. You find... Pantera, you find things that are, oh, there's a little bit more of an edge to this. There's something in that that trail of those bands going back to punk and discovering the misfits through Metallica. It all was just like heavy music. You know, it was all just something that was edgy and different and a little bit dangerous, but also there was melodies mixed in that were complex and not just like, you know, new kids on the block melodies and stuff like that. And so I think that that trail is a pretty common one, you know. From there, I stumbled into Misfits, and then you stumble into Bad Religion, and then everything changed up. But I mean, Bad Religion and Descendants were two of the first bands. And then from there, it's like, 
you know, the whole door opens up and I found something, you know, and I was the only kid in my school at the time that, that had that, but I had my own little thing and I had something that connected. I got into skateboarding. And then really what blew things open for me was one town over in a different school district. One of my friends had moved away and I saw him randomly in the summer because we only got together so often. And in that year or six months that I had seen him last, he became friends with all the kids that were into skateboarding and punk in his school district. And so there was this group of about eight kids that were into the same thing I was into. They were into the same music I was into. There was the same activities like during the summer. And that was just, I just ate it up. And then discovering bands like Dillinger 4 from Minneapolis at that time. And that the Minneapolis scene in that moment was so vibrant. It was small. It was all basements. But there was so much diversity between Dillinger 4, Manafraid, Disembodied, and then even like Code 13. And, you know, then you dig in all around that, you know, Threadbare, Harvest. Um, there was a lot of creativity coming out of Minneapolis. I mean, it was so accessible. And it just, if you're a 14 year old kid and all that stuff is within a three mile distance of your parents' house, it's pretty hard to avoid it, you know? Um, and you just find your place. And uh, from there I was hooked. So, yeah, totally. And then it's just that nonstop pursuit of, it, it becomes like a drug. It's like the nonstop, the next high. Like what's the next record that's gonna blow my mind? Because it happened before and it happens, it happens every couple months and it just becomes a never ending chase for that, mm. that music or that experience, you know, that just gets, gets you pumped up. Yeah. Uh, and shout out to Man Afraid. Uh, I think it's cool that they recently did some stuff together. So that's, uh, that's good. It's good that they're, they're paying tribute to their, to their singer who passed away. So that's cool. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no, it was, it, it was an honor. We actually got to play with them and it was a cool man. I had, I pulled no punches about telling them what I thought. So that's awesome, man. Uh, I remember that's one of the first things you and I connected on was your man afraid tattoo. Yep. Um, and, all right. uh, yeah, no more, no more man afraid talk. We'll get derailed. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so you start playing in bands in your yep. bands. Were you always kind of like the, the business person? Not really. Mm -hmm. I think, I mean, in my first, first band, mm -hmm. it was just four high school kids and we just wanted to play music. Mm -hmm. And it was just a never ending democratic, like, okay, whose car are we piling stuff into? Our singer, like the first shows we played, I, none of us could drive except for our singer. And so it's just sort of figure out how do we get our stuff to the show? Uh, one of the guys had a mom who was pretty supportive. So we loaded up the minivan every once in a while. Um, there was no business to that though. And then holding on era kind of, but I would say that the other guys, they were just older. I was pretty young still. I mean, I started playing that band when I was 16. So I think, they were in their 20s so i just trusted their age um and so as that happened the band were like martyr ad kind of happened and it kind of happened by accident in a lot of ways it was more so you know i was the new guy i was i knew my place i was just the drummer man that was my job just mm -hmm. drum write the songs play them well live and you know we'll hang out when we need to and i it was not to say like i was like put into a corner but i just knew that you know joel and tara had experience for much longer than friends that went much further back than than i knew them and so i wasn't trying to be like hey i'm the new guy you got to hang out with me because you like them i just kind of did my own thing and then the business side of that kind of came in towards the last year or so just out of again necessity um you know we needed to buy a van i bought the van uh we needed to get shirts made and you know it becomes a coordination on that front between art files and everything else and just kind of the, it was never sort of a, it was never on purpose. Um, and, you know, to a, to a degree, learning more and more about that business side of it might've expedited my exit in a lot of ways, you know, I and mean, there was that tour we were supposed to do. And I had committed to finishing that round, but the band broke up three days before the tour started. And uh, I think part of that came from the fact that I just became more aware of the business. And so there was more internal discussion. There wasn't, it wasn't just like, I'm along for the ride. It's like, Hey, like there's a better way to do this. And if we're not all on the same page, you know, I wasn't that eloquent. No one was that eloquent about it at the time, but it became a reality where you're like, Hey, wait a second, we shouldn't be doing it this way or something's not right about this. And mm -hmm. that kind of made me made the decision pretty easy for me, honestly. Yeah. I, I was always a fan of everyone in holding on and uh, in martyr AD. I thought it was just like a great two, you know, different, different things but like great groups of people right. um i always felt it was interesting the choice to be on victory and i want to talk that's why i was asking you about the business stuff because i i wanted to know like what did you learn 
like, what did you learn about the business of music by being on a record label like Victory, which while I absolutely have such good memories about records on Victory, bands on Victory, Clint, right. who I absolutely love, shout out to Clint. I mean, Victory yeah, is up, like, you know, you know, Victory had, had came under fire for some kind of like some business stuff that might be maybe questionable. I don't know. I was never on the label, but I, I was always interested and always wanted to ask you, like, what did you see there that helped form up your thinking about what you would go on to do at Bridge Nine and then later at Kings Road? Well, what not to do. I mean, that's just as important as learning what to do. I think uh, the funny thing about it in that time, I actually, I only had one kind of contentious conversation with Tom. Mm. Um, And it was just him dragging out, repaying us for recording. Mm. And because I fronted a bunch of money on my side because no one else would. So I was just like, it was affecting me personally. And I'm just like, I need this. But once we got past that, I, we were never one of his bread and butter bands. Like we, at that time, you got to keep in mind, he had Thursday, he had Taking Back Sunday, who was going through their battles with him. Uh, Hatebreed had already left and that was a whole different situation. Um, stuff like Bayside and Silverstein was starting to blow up for him. He had so Hawthorne Heights was on the course to having a gold record. I think he actually liked us musically and didn't view us as like a, a profit vehicle. And whether or not like we could have a normal, relatable conversation, we never really had a battle about anything because my first real business foray into this was our contract promised us $3,000 a month in tour support for whatever the definition of tour was. I think it was 14 shows in a consecutive 20 whatever day block. And so that was considered a tour and the label was supposed to give us $3,000 to help facilitate that. We knew that shit was tooth fairy money. We knew that was never coming. So we just used the print shop. Shout out to Bill Smiles. Uh, we just used the print shop at Victory, and I don't. I to this day, I'm, now I can say it because he's out of business and he can't come knocking for it. We never even looked at the invoices because we just knew whatever <laughs> merchandise we got. We just kind of considered it a house play, where it's like eh, he owes us this much money, we owe him that much money. It's probably level. Yeah. I did a I did a quick estimate at the end of the band, just like you know, in that blur of how we broke up so quickly Mm -hmm. and we probably owed him like 10 grand for merch Mm -hmm. like you know it's not that bad (laughs) you know what i mean but he owed us he owed us he owed us thirty six thousand dollars for tour support so you know tomato tomato well that's the thing about like listen if you run your business in a way that doesn't treat people well they're gonna find a way to to they're gonna find a way to get paid to take it out on you right right like yeah so for us but we also knew we weren't we didn't have the kind of money on the line that those bands did i mean you know nothing but respect i mean in a weird way he created his own demise you know and i think it's pretty it's so well documented now i'm not even talking out of school about it Mm -hmm. but like he created the one band who had the resources to go after him and they brought him down and so you know all of those decisions all of that arrogance and bravado and all of those nights out of you know splashing the card down and telling everybody how great you are that last moment came up and it got him you know it was some game of thrones shit like he created his own downfall and uh you know i don't think anybody's shedding any tears over him but he got what he had coming and i think that it's that's a and key for thing anyone learned. for anyone listening he's still alive like oh well, like, i'm talking just pure business I'm just we're talking, talking pure and he's business. not gonna hear this and if he hears this he wants to talk about it this is all facts totally <laughs> totally, totally. I, i'm on record saying i've never had a bad conversation with him uh there was one time i i <laughs> accidentally bc steed clint on a very snarky email and i got a phone call from tony five minutes later because it was somebody that he didn't like and we had a great conversation. He found out I was in town uh, when I hit up I hit up Clint to go get lunch one day when I was in town for Dropkicks and Rants and I went to Chicago for the, the show down there. And Clint texted me about a half an hour before I got down. He's like, hey, Tony found out you're coming to the office. Like, is it cool? I was like, of course. What yeah. wouldn't be cool about it? You yeah. know, <laughs> totally. he just won't go out and get lunch. I'll just sit yeah. in the office and he'll talk. It'll be great. Man, can, but, I tell you my, can I tell you my story about Tony? <laughs> yeah, of course. Who All doesn't right. want to hear that? Um, did I ever tell you this story before? You might have, but okay. I mean, it's been so many years and the whole world hasn't heard it. So tell it. Yeah. All right, first of all, shout out to Clint Hart, dude, you rule. I absolutely love you. He's still just the coolest dude. And it's like one of those things where it's like, at some point, 
when he's comfortable, I want to get like the victory record story through his eyes. Like, I mean, not for nothing, man. He, Tony, whatever, like not here going to, I'm not defending or disparaging anybody's mm-hmm. honor here. Mm-hmm. He hired some good people. Yeah. He had like Chicago. He made, he made an independent label. I mean, he hired some really good people that are still around, you know, I mean, mm-hmm. Stephanie Marlowe was there at the time and she was great to us and yeah. Clint, Heather yeah. West, uh, you know, the, the art guy, Jason now works at Epitaph. Um, there's all, there's a lot like Bill Smiles. I mean, he was in the print shop, you yeah. know, but he had, he had good people in there, uh, mm-hmm. treating them differently. You know, and that's not my, my topic. I think that's pretty well documented. Monica was another person that worked there who was, who was awesome. And so he did have a way of bringing in people who were committed, you know, um, well, it's the, the, end, the, down, the end result is, is a different topic, but the, yeah. the people themselves he hired were good people who were committed for sure. Well, dude, he built like, he built a label that launched the careers of, in, of people who went on to go do insane things who maybe would have been successful without victory, or maybe we would never have known who they were. Or maybe they would have put out a record on a label that would have just like kind of just pushed a little bit. Like there are huge bands that was, that that his label is responsible for. And there right. are great people who've gone on to do so many things who either were on bands on his label or worked at the label. Like, I mean, the influence of what he did is huge and his business practices were not good. Right. I mean, it also shows you like, you can create an empire through two means, Mm -hmm. you know, and he did have a little bit of an empire for a while, but the whole Mm -hmm. time he was doing nothing but but trampling on people and making enemies. Mm -hmm. And then the counterpart to that is there's a lot of people who, you know, and I'm not even talking about even, I mean, Epitaph's not even in that class, like it's a different topic for me, Mm -hmm. but there's a lot of, there's a lot of labels out there. I would say in that similar world, I mean, whether it's hopeless or whether it's, uh, I mean, more recent labels like pure noise Mm -hmm. where, there is that treatment and that respect and that loyalty and that patience and that uh, reciprocal nature of things. Mm-hmm. And it's not just a one-way street. And I think that the Tony lesson of, of I, wish there was a, I wish there was a way to make that a book. You know what I mean? Hopefully somebody, I mean, the only other book that was out there was that Ramsey Dean expose of him just talking about all the crappy behind the scenes thing that got leaked. <laughs> yeah. But like, I mean, it was interesting and I knew, I knew him and yeah. uh, it, was, uh, it was a fun thing to read kind of. But I think like there's a certain level from music business, but all business in general of just how, I mean, it's, dude, it's very, it's Trumpy, man. Let's be honest. It's Trump stuff. Mm-hmm. Like it's a well, one way street. It's taking advantage of every corner and mm-hmm. you can still get to a, get to an end with that, but it's not going to be a good one. Yeah. And I'm, I'm actually going to bring up something in a little bit of, around that. Um, but I, like we said, you can build an empire by like, st- like trampling people, or you can build an empire by like building people up and creating a great culture. And, and I think that's 100% as easy as that, like choose one of those roads. And it doesn't mean if you're going to, if you're building it up, you're always going to do the right thing and be an angel. You screw up, you make bad decisions, but it's like, if you aspire to build something that lifts people up and you follow that practice, you might not get there as fast as someone else, but you'll right. likely build something that's going to last versus if you build something uh, by cutting every corner, stomping on people, it's like, yeah, you might get to the top, but eventually for most people, there's going to be a curtain call. Let me tell you my Tony story though. So yep. um, the band I was in at the time had put out an LP that had done quite well. And uh, we were getting you know, asked about by other labels. And we had two back-to-back meetings. We had one at Victory Records one day and then one at Equal Vision Records the next day. And they could not have been different, more different meetings. So I was like the, the like quote unquote business guy in the band uh, and we go to victory and we're there with Clint who I like, God, I love you, Clint. You're the best. We go there with, yeah. we go there with Clint and we get led into this like waiting room. It's like, Tony will be here in a minute. And you know, there's like a, like an exercise machine, you know, like in yeah. there and there's like framed pictures of the wall of him, like standing on desks and being like, ah. <laughs> I'm like, this is like amazing. I, I can't believe what I'm experiencing. Anyways, dude keeps us waiting for, I don't know, like 20, 30 minutes, like late for his meeting. And it's the first like adult meeting I've been to. I I had already been a therapist at this point, but this was the first like business meeting I'd ever been to. And I was like, is this guy like just running late or is this like some kind of weird power move? I got my answer instantly. We got ushered into this room 
he was behind, which I'm sure you've been in his office, like his humongous yeah. desk. He was wearing a baby pink Fred Perry polo with the collar popped. And yep. he comes out from behind the, the his desk. He's like a little Napoleon guy, shakes my hand with this like bear claw. He's like, good to meet you, Aram. I was like, ah, he's crushing my hand. And we sit down and I thought at that point, like I, I was like a trained therapist. Like I had been in all sorts of hairy conversations in my life. I thought yeah. I was going to go in there and like handle this. This cat decimated me. He just yelled at me for about an hour. And he was like, <laughs> he was like, all right, this is what we're going to do for your band. You're going to put out a new record every single year. You know, rap cars, you know, cars that have full wraps around them. We're like, yeah, he's like, we're going to do one for every single record. You're going to have a rap. It's going to be a barrier dead. And your band is going to be the other rap. We're going to do those raps for cars. We're like, that sounds kind of corny. No, if you want to play in the big leagues, that's what you do. And he starts like, he's going, he's like, you, what do you do for a living? And someone's like, I work at a grocery store. You, what do you do for a living? I work at a gas station. That's depressing. You, what do you do for a living? <laughs> it was like, it, it was completely insane. And then he was like, so are you guys ready to sign on? Are you ready to sign on to victory? And I was like, well, you know, we've got, we've got some other interests. We're just kind of like taking meetings right now. I was like, meetings? Let me tell you something, man. Let me tell you something. You could be the most ripped person on the planet. You could have 0% body fat. You could just have traps. You could be super strong. You could be able to run for hours without getting tired. But you know what? If the guy across the field from you has a better gun, he's got a better gun. He's got better bullets. And he's holding his hand and like touching as if there's bullets. He's like, if the guy across the field from you has a better gun and this guy could be out of shape, he could be lazy. He could know nothing about anything. But if he has that better gun and he knows how to shoot it, I don't care how good you are, you're dead. Victory has the biggest guns and we're holding all the bullets. And then it's just silent for a second. And I'm not kidding. It's just silent for a second. He goes, pull the trigger. <laughs> and I was like, holy shit. I don't know what to do. I feel like I'm going to like jump and scream and run away. Like if he'd put a contract in front of me, I probably would be like, okay, I'm so sorry. <laughs> anyway, he leaves. Clint, who had probably seen this a million times, is like, right. you okay? And I'm like, <laughs> I don't know what just happened. And then that night we went and played a show. The next day we play, or we go to Equal Vision. We meet with Bill Scoville and Steve Reddy. Steve Reddy yeah. is where is in like a cinder block office, basically. He's wearing like running shorts and flip-flops. And like one of his flip-flops is kind of like gently dangling from his foot as he's talking to me. He's like, man, you guys are straight edge. I'm straight edge. Hardcore's awesome. You guys want to do a record? And we we're like, yeah. Yes, we do. We want to do a record. They were offering us way less money, like a different right. kind of contract, everything. But like the experience of being in this like big office in Chicago and like having this dude who's clearly like done very well for himself and had all these huge bands yelling at us, but doing a hard sell versus this other guy who's also been very successful, had lots of big bands in, in his like warehouse office, basically, but who's totally relatable totally real yeah. guy comes from the culture understands what we're about and the business meeting with him was basically just like oh yeah like love to do a record with you guys like you know like i love i love all the bands you love you know, i'm still straight edge hey you guys want to go get burritos and we're like yes we do and that's why we didn't put out a record in the end we broke up beforehand but like i learned so much from what I would go on to do in business by these two different things. It's like, we're talking to two people who had like literally multi-million dollar record labels. Right. And one of them is like a cartoon. The other one is just like approachable. Who are you going to want to work with? Well, and I think, I think that that's, it, it, yeah. I mean, it's the same thing that we've talked about in multiple different facets. It's just like, there's two different ways. And, and I think the one thing that I take away from you know, if I could take a lesson out of the victory world is just that I never want to work with somebody who doesn't want to work with me. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, just imagine how miserable that is okay. where you have to, you have to shut that part of your mind off where I don't need everybody that we work with to think I'm their best friend, mm. but I think they need to know that they can reach out to me and I'm here to talk and I can, I'm here to help out. 
but I mean, we've had bands break their contracts with us and what am I going to do? So you know what I mean? Like there's a certain level of, of just, you know, maybe there's a certain situation where I actually would do that. You never know, never say never, but also at some point it's like, what do you gain from that? What do, if a band doesn't want to work with you or a person doesn't want to work with you, a contract, sure, you have that contract. But by the time that decision is hit, where they decide, and this is natural, if people hit a point where they decide they don't want to work with you anymore, whether it's a client what, of any kind, any business, you've had enough conversations at that point as that relationship's declining, and you've had enough chances to kind of recognize it and step up and fix it before you hit that terminal point. And I just think that the, the, the component and the conversations and like reading that the book sell out by Dan Ozzy that he wrote recently, mm-hmm. like the, the experiences of bands like Thursday mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, knowing some of the behind the scenes stuff just from being on the label at the time of what was going on with Taking Back Sunday and then knowing some of the hate breed stuff just from, you know, passed down tales. It wasn't like I was having detailed stories, but I feel like a lot of that stuff has become public. I just can't imagine wanting to live in a world where you just create that level of contention and wallow in it. And I just, that's not a way to be, that's not a way to live. And it's not a way to do anything for a long term, and I think that you know the ending of it makes sense. Yeah, um, totally, man. In that case, you know, it just so happened that it was a different form of it, but there were other moments where, and and there are situations where bands decide, like sometimes irrationally, sometimes rationally, like they need to be in a different place for their band. Mm-hmm. But you can do that the right way, or you can do that the wrong way. Mm-hmm. And I think that it sort of comes down to not wanting to. Like, why would you want to hold anybody against their will to work with you because they signed with you for a reason or they're working with you. They, they agreed to work with your person, not to keep using label references, but it could go for consulting. It could go for anything mm-hmm. and just working. Why would you want to work with somebody who just doesn't want to work with you? Totally, man. Like flat out, where it's just like a contentious, battle-ridden, stressful relationship. It's totally. just miserable. All right, so we're we're heading a little bit towards the end of the interview. I do yeah. want to ask you about your time at Bridge Nine. So, yeah. Murder AD wraps up. Yep. And correct me if I'm wrong, but was you were I think the title was label manager at Bridge Nine. Is that right? Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, general manager, label manager, something like that. Was that your first like adult job, like real job? Uh, more or less. I mean, one of the funny things was when Martyr broke up. I was just trying to find something because I didn't have any money saved up. I was expecting to be touring for four or five months after that. And uh, I got a job at a 40 year old virgin style eBay store. Um, it was a couple who worked at target and he was, he ran his own construction company. So they, were, they had money mm-hmm. and she took a, she took a, a really large severance offer, you know, just to leave because she was an executive level position. And so they wanted to start this up and there was a franchise of, of eBay stores that gave you the software. They, you know, helped facilitate shipping deal negotiations, kind of worked with eBay because eBay was an independent company or maybe they were public at that time. But it was kind of a weird industry, but that was my first foray into mail order. You know what I mean? It was my first foray into like listing things on the internet, selling things, direct customer service because you're actually dealing with the people when they drop stuff off and uh, learning just some, some of those ins and outs of human nature as well. And, uh, you know, how to negotiate the commission you're taking. You know, it's all stuff that like later transcended to stuff that I do. But it was, you know, there was high tides and like very like crazy moments. And all of a sudden you have three staff people and I somehow I beat out, I don't know how I beat out. The, there were some people who applied for that job because it wasn't a great job market. And uh, they gave me the job because they just felt like I was going to dive in and they were right. I was in that first year, like I only worked there for a year. And, uh, you know, when I went out to Boston, when Chris was hiring and the opportunity came up and I told them I was going to leave, they weren't upset. They're like, we knew you wouldn't last forever here. And, uh, you know, if anything, like they, they operated the store that first year and didn't lose money. So for me, that was like a, a, a bit of a badge of honor. Cause it's like, the, what a weird business to get into. And what a weird thing, even 20 years later to 15 or I mean, 17 years later, to say, I worked at an eBay store selling things on eBay for people and it kind of paid my bills for a year. Yeah. That's pretty cool. And I would say like that, but that wasn't, I mean, it was a real job, but then it was also like you close the doors and the other owner and like, we just listen to Tom Waits and have some beers and just type away on the computers for a while. So like, I guess that's a real job, mm-hmm. but um, Bridge and I was the first time I'm like, I'm in an office, 
I have like deeper responsibilities and expectations and knowing there was a world that was already aware of what that was had a different level to it. So I would say like, yeah, that was probably my first like big time job. Yeah. So when you came into bridge nine, it was a interesting time. And, uh, you know, I imagine Chris is going to listen to this. So Chris, a, I love you. Thank you so much for everything you did uh, for me with all your bands. B, I hope you won't take offense to what I'm about to say. Um, when you came into bridge nine, bridge nine had kind of been a victim of its own success. It had grown super, super fast. Uh, and it didn't really have a system in place. Like I, right. I re remember how things were. And oh, so Chris had, it was weird because I, I know they shared a space with, with uh, death wish at the time. And there's like mm -hmm. a shared employees and, you know, there's like, I remember being in there and just feeling like it's a bad vibe. Like there was like a lot of discontent within the office labels, maybe not getting along as well. Not everyone in the office is getting along well, Chris owning businesses. And it, it, it just had like a messy feel like everything was messy. And I remember the first times, uh, the early days we'd go to Bridge Nine, I was like, this is so dope. I'm so excited to be on this record label. And as we were starting to transition and go like, kind of think what's next for us, I remember feeling like, oh, this doesn't feel like it used to feel. It feels like, um, it feels like just not good. And then you came in and you had to set all that straight. So what was that like? It was crazy. I mean, you know, and also, you know, you have to think about it too, from the perspective. And, and again, this is like, you know, just going back to the times when I came out and I, I mean, I came out to Boston, I flew myself out because I really wanted the, the deal. And I knew like bridge nine wasn't doing a crazy amount of stuff at the time. I mean, it was a transitional period of like that first boom. And then the coinciding like side business. I know he's been on the podcast and he's talked about it. So like when Sully's was really turning like legit, legit was 2004 with that world series run, which coincides with when the things start getting rocky with some of the big bands. And so it made sense. Like, what are you going to focus your time on? You know what I mean? Like, where are you going to put your attention? And a lot of it too. I mean, that office had, there's a lot of parallels to that office of being in a van. Like it was the, the office equivalent of being in a van where it was these people who were all trying to do similar things, but different. They're all swimming in the same pools, but different. They're all kind of coexisting and collaborating, but then at the same time they're competing. Mm -hmm. And it was just, it was too much and too small of a space. And then, you know, then for me, the thing that I think was beneficial just on the cultural level was that I didn't have the baggage that they had with each other, the differences of, of opinion, the different experiences of, you know, you spilled coffee on my side of the floor kind of stuff. Like that wasn't something I had to deal with. I wasn't, a, I didn't live on Mission Hill in those days. I didn't have that sort of like early nineties to 2000, early 2000s transition that a lot of them had in that same experience. So I was kind of like Switzerland in a lot of those things. And um, I just did what I did, you know, I could, I could have conversations with people directly because they knew it was coming from an independent place. And, um, you know, I think, of the, I mean, Look, that that move in 2007, when Bridge Nine went one direction, one town over, Death Wish went one town over, it was the best for everybody. I mean, it really was. Like, it was, it's, it was, it did create, it was, you know, it's like getting space in the space away from the van. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Totally. Um, and I think that had that move not happened mm -hmm. at the time it did, where we had like a two year buffer, and then I can talk to Jake, Converge would have never worked with us. Not to say like, I never had a contentious relationship with him, but it was just that the environment and the, uh, you know, everybody was just trying to work hard and everybody was trying to grind it out. And it was, it, it just, it was too much and too small of a space. And it was a really intense experience. But at the same point, it, I wasn't really beholden to that history. Um, and I think it's, I think it's awesome. I mean, Chris just had to move out recently because the building was being sold, I think. I think that's why he moved out. But I mean, Death Wish is still in that building that they moved into 15 years ago mm -hmm. and they're still running. And I think they've taken over two or three floors since then. Mm -hmm. But it's, uh, it was a really, it, it, there was things, there was also a really fucking cool place to be. It was a cool environment. You know, one little section is the screen printing shop. Then you got Pike and Tara behind you yelling on the phone and, and like Pike booked our band. So there was a certain level of relatability and you, the, just the people you get to meet mm -hmm. and you know, going back on it and looking back on it, it's like, I do think we, whether or not it was a positive in hindsight for everybody, it was a really formidable time. And it was a really cool thing to think of 
mm-hmm. how young everybody was mm-hmm. and how, you know, I mean, going back to that Inatech office, like the, the office behind Fenway, how young everybody was and they're doing what they were doing and how little of a guidebook there was, you know? Yeah. Um, and that part to me is just like, I don't know that the world will ever have that again. And to be there, like I wasn't on the ground floor. Um, if anything, I was sort of like brought in as like a renovation crew. But I was like, I look back on it and it's just like, man, that was really cool. It was a really cool thing because mm-hmm. everyone there was able to pay their bills. Mm-hmm. And the the person responsible for those paychecks was for all of us. I'm not saying they were all hired by each other, but there wasn't a there wasn't a master boss outside of that building that somebody yeah. was talking about. The master boss was the landlord that was getting the rent. Yeah. And it was a really cool thing, just like a self-creating, self-generating sort of environment. And to this day, you know, Baker just moved liberated out. He's still running it and they bought a building like outside of Boston and he's, you know, really still doing it. Mm-hmm. Um, and he came into that, it was the same thing. He came into that business. I don't think he had ever printed a shirt. Mm-hmm. And so to create that out of that, you know, that environment and that, uh, no one else was going to give them that, that guidebook. They didn't did it. And so that part, that part is really cool. And then that, that kind of stuff is really exciting to be around and, um, to think about, but yeah, it was, it was a lesson in like, you know, shutting the hell up sometimes for sure. Well, you know, I, I want to deciding wanna, is this worth it or not? Yeah. I want to tuck into that, man. Cause you came into a situation and, and, you know, just for I, I, anyone who's listening probably knows that I have such deep love and respect for, for Chris. And I also, on the flip side, death wish is like Trey's like one of my best friends. Like we're, He's like right. one of my rider I mean, guys. I, I talk to Rich and Trey still. I mean, I talk to Rich more often than I talk to Trey. I talked to Jake this morning by text, but like still in touch with all these guys. And I think right. it's, it is funny to think about those moments, especially Rich, because he was in the same boat as me, yeah. where it's just like coming in and, and not having those fights, like not having to yeah. have those disagreements about who got which band. You well, know, totally. So like, they, you've got this like ecosystem of people who are all super creative, hardworking, like they don't ask for permission, they just do it. They're kind of collective, but they're kind of competing. And at one point, there's like a unspoken openly, but spoken a lot behind the scenes kind of sourness that is existing between a bunch of different businesses. And they're like actual businesses that people make their living from. And you get dropped right in the middle in the middle and i like what you said when you're like hey i wasn't really there to build the business i was on the ground floor i was there to renovate for me that's one of the most interesting times of bridge nine so it was a time where the band the main band that i had been in um i remember you coming in and me just being like Fucking thank god like carl help me with this thing with yeah. all of these like you know kind of like all these things that we've been talking about you helped set the business straight for this band that i'd been in and it was very and it wasn't like because of bad reasons. It was just like a label that had grown too fast. And I think Chris was literally like, had like receipts and boxes and stuff like that. Still, there wasn't like a, Oh no. I mean, it was, yeah, it was, it was a, it was a, it was still an, like a very small independent kind of world, but the, the momentum of it was much bigger than that. Totally. So you helped Chris or helped the label go from that stage to what bridge one bridge nine went on to be, which is, it was kind of like a, you know, the, I always laugh when I think of Epitaph because Epitaph like moves and just so different. Like they're doing things like right. architects are bringing me the horizon and people are like, whoa, like that's so weird. Think like when Rev was doing like all of these bands, it's like, oh, Rev has gotten so weird now. Bridge Nine end, ended up having it's kind of like weird phase too, right? Where you started yeah. doing more like indie bands and bands that yeah. were super cool bands, but bands that I think had more commercial appeal. Um, how much were you involved in that? Very. Yeah. I mean, was Chris that, was, was that very... your choice or was that like your idea? Was it Chris's or was it? I think Chris was open to it. I definitely drove it. I mean, it's been a long time since I've thought about that stuff because part of it is just, I don't look back and analyze it too much. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think he was always very supportive. I think of that, you know, I mean, sometimes there were things, different bands and, you know, but once the, once the momentum starts building, there was a lot of freedom there, you know, I mean, like whether it was, um, I don't know, pick a band, I mean, Crime and Stare, I mean, he had that Have Hard Things We Carry hadn't come out yet by the time I started there. And that the label was kind of trying to figure out what to do there. And because it was, you know, it was a transitional period. Um, 
but that hadn't come out yet. So that was obviously coming out. I think that came out in August of that year and I had started like end of May. And so really like as that had been turned in and files were starting to get going, like kind of digging in on that and just, you know, even, even diving in, there was so much else going on. I mean, I think Outbreak's record came out right around that time. Chris had signed a bunch of bands where records were still coming out. And it was just a matter of like, okay, here's a job now manage. What, you know, what does that mean? Like <laughs> manage what, like, what does that even entail? And very quickly you realize it's just, you know, you fill your day up and you figure it out. Um, but then as like opportunities came up, I mean, I went to the first, this is hardcore. And that was a, an experience for me of like what seeing H2O and realizing, holy shit, these guys still kick ass. Mm -hmm. Like this band is still awesome. Mm -hmm. And it, I mean, it's funny to think about how long ago that was, but they had put out that record on the major and kind of floundered for a little while, but came up in top form, man, top, top form. And Paul from Kill Your Idols was playing bass for them on that run. And he's an old friend of mine. And so when I talked to Chris about it and I asked him, I was like, hey, we should try to sign H2O. Mm -hmm. And there wasn't much of an objection. I think there was a bit of a, Chris, Chris can text me and tell me if I'm wrong, but there's a little bit of opposition to the advance, just a little bit. But uh, it worked out for everybody, it was fine. But there was a moment where it was like, I think in that case, I think I agreed to 25 or 30% more than he told me to. Mm -hmm. But uh, thanks for forgiving me, Chris, it worked out. <laughs> <laughs> and it, I mean, it worked out for everyone. H2O put worked, out. H2O, H2O they put out their best. catapulted up. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that experience introduced us to Chad from Newfound. And so like that period of Newfound Glory being on Bridge Nine was really cool because they had been dropped from a major. And it kind of helped transition them and they're still kicking ass. They're actually a King's Road client now. And they didn't become a client until two years, not a year and a half ago. Mm -hmm. And so it wasn't like it happened right away. Yeah. Um, and so just having those kind of experiences and those kind of things and understanding like, yeah, some people are gonna, you know, look down upon this, but then also to be able to, be able to work with, you know, Ceremony, who was still at that moment, hardcore. I mean, I think the record that came out after I left is my favorite record of theirs, you know, we're on our park. But the band we signed at the time was still just like a fierce hardcore band. And uh, then you have Crime and Stereo, who was totally different. Death Before Dishonor was doing their own thing. And they were starting to cook really strongly in Europe. And they were already going by the time I got there. But it was just, a, it was a fun thing to be around. And to it felt like there was something really cool developing. And I think there was. There was something kind of unique. And, mm -hmm. and uh, it was a cool time. But there were the weird bands, you know. I, I mean, it, we had, I mean, and even the, the fact that like, a band like have heart because of what what was done behind the scenes and and obviously their own creation but like they legitimately were on the billboard top 200 you know what i mean like yeah. that's fucking crazy it's still well, crazy to think of have it. have heart or have heart are in my opinion um well they're a timeless band for sure but right i think sure. maybe the maybe the biggest hardcore band of all time maybe i mean that's the thing is like you got to think about like sick of it all and those kind of bands from when we were growing up meaning hate breed Mm -hmm. they were selling more records mm -hmm. and they were playing some big shows. Like, I mean, mm -hmm. Hatebreed still, you know, they're, they have hardcore roots. I mean, it's like, are they hardcore? Are they metal? It's like, I kind of call them the motorhead of the hardcore metal scene where it's just like, they kind of are those things, but mm -hmm. you know, I mean, definitely, I mean, they were playing shows with code 13 in Minneapolis. Like their roots are definitely a hardcore band, but in terms of like what maybe traditional hardcore, I would say so. Cause even like, what was, I mean, American nightmare at the time, like they probably sold more records, but it was a smaller world. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And I think the have heart staying power is something that I think is really amazing to see. Yeah, I mean, um, just uh, you know, the cultural impact in that band of that band cannot be undersold. And, and I don't think anyone is. I don't think anyone's trying to undersell. I don't think. It. I don't think there's anyone underselling what they've yeah. done. I think if anyone's going to undersell it, they're going to be the first ones to be honest I would agree. about it. I, I would agree. But yeah. like they they were a band that they were one of those bands that had those opportunities I mean, they had big managers trying to sign them mm -hmm. they had big bands that wanted to take them out on tour like big rock bands wanted to take them i want to say under oath wanted to take them out on tour and like those are really hard things for some bands to say no and i don't think those guys thought about it for a second it was just like eh, not especially what we want to do. especially when you're young right and that's again that right. idea of like when you're when you're doing something and it's meaningful to people you've got some choices and you can do choices that would catapult that and you can milk it and there's nothing wrong with that i think a lot of people do that and that's that's fine but it, it's that like to what degree to what degree are you comfortable 
milking something or taking those leaps to be successful? And what do you lose for it? Uh, I think have heart obviously made all the, well, I don't know all the decisions they were faced with, but uh, it, I'd say from a fan perspective and from a cultural perspective, they certainly, their impact was huge. Now I, I want to focus on you though, just for another few minutes before we start wrapping yeah. it up. All right. I don't want to get into specifics like dance, da, 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 but like, I also know in your time uh, in doing this kind of work, you've had to deal with some extreme situations and some extreme yeah. personalities, like really, really tough personalities. And like really specifically, I remember one time just thinking like, I, you and I have always been like friendly and, you know, I'd say like friends, like we know each other, but it's right. not like we spend a lot of time. There was one, there was one time I remember reflecting on something that was happening in a, in a, in a situation you were dealing with music related. And I thought, Carl's a really good guy. Like he, and, and just your like integrity was shining through like just integrity and it really stood out for me of like when you're involved in business and like we all know the kind of classic like eh, like business person like you know like doing like right. doing the dirty behind the scenes like being crappy but like really practically like in the business world it is very easy in big 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 business to do shitty things and there's a lot of pressure to do it a lot of people willing to look sideways a lot of just going with the culture and like, I think most people, especially in the punk scene, come up and kind of look at business and be like, oh, that's bad, but flip it. Like subculture, punk, hardcore, like whatever sub subculture, there's tons of awful shit that happens and oh, yeah. really bad, really bad business stuff, like straight up bad business stuff. And it is actually our version of that shitty business person, like doing dirty deals behind the scenes or being shitty or, or kind of letting the bad things happen without saying anything because it's going to cost you financially or culturally. And I, I really like, I admire you a lot because I know you've been in some situations like that. And from, at least from my perspective, you've walked the right path. Now I'm not trying to get you to talk about anything specific, but just right. really like, was that something that was always in you or was it something that you made a decision to do uh, when you were in the world? I think it's one of those things. And this goes, whether it's physical conflict or verbal conflict, mm -hmm. I try to avoid it until the last possible step. Mm -hmm. um, and so how do you do that? You know, cause it's like, you can't be just willing to push over, but I just think it, it comes back. Like what the things that you'll get into conflicts about, like if, if somebody made a mistake, if you made a mistake or if somebody responsible for it made a mistake, it's a lot easier to be like, Hey, they screwed up. They work for me. I didn't make the mistake, but it's my mistake. Like, how do we fix that? Like, I made the choice to hire them. I don't regret hiring them, but I trust them. The person I trusted made a mistake. So it's my world to clean up. Um, and I think that that kind of comes with, you know, once you deal with everybody openly, you know, and you deal with things transparently and you don't hide a bunch of crap, it makes those resolutions a lot easier. And so, you know, whether it's, you know, diffusing a situation or whether it's clarifying something or whether somebody, I mean, I've had people accuse me of stealing from them. You know what I mean? But you want to see our, I'll literally do a screen share and show you my accounting system and show you where the money comes in. And if you don't like how that report looks, well, I'm sorry. Like I can't change that, but I can tell you that this is, I'll give I'll open the doors to the castle up and you can see what I'm looking at. Mm -hmm. And I've actually done that before. Uh, they still left, but I think it's also one of those things. Like I'd rather have it be, I'd rather have those departures be on good terms. If somebody's going to leave, um, there's nothing to be gained from having those sort of bad blood, that bad blood in the world. So I think that's just always kind of been a, I don't know that it was any sort of deliberate conversation. I think it's just life is hard. Life is stressful, you know, forgetting the pandemic and everything else going on and, and regardless of, of whatever civil issues are going on, and there's plenty to choose from, you know what I mean? There's, there's plenty of things in the world that are off, but even without that, even without those things, there's still just, it's short and there's no point in creating that wallowing and negativity. And so just being honest and being open and getting to a resolution as quickly as possible really is just sort of the, not even the easiest way to go because it can be hard sometimes, mm -hmm. but it is the best way to carry on. You know I mean? I, one of my one of my very specific memories, and I might have told this on a different podcast, but uh, we had we have a we we've been working with Dropkick Murphys for ten years now, um, and they're on a six month contract. 
So they, at this point, are free to, they, they can fire us anytime, you know, and it's been that way since the deal started. And we weren't a big company when they started working with us. And they gave us that trust. And so that's one thing I've never taken for granted. But our first tour order for them, first, first tour, the first show was in Toronto. And uh, we got the files a little late. I was like, whatever, we'll make anything happen. We got the files and got the shirts printed. And f- the four boxes for the tour didn't show up. The, the actual tour shirts, because one show in Toronto, and then they were crossing back into the States. Mm-hmm. And through connections, that's how I met Chris Cresswell, because he was living in Toronto and was home at the time. And he went to FedEx to actually go try to pick those boxes up. They found three of the four boxes. The driver just skipped the venue that day. So anyway, that's show number one. Show three was when the rest of the merch showed up. Milwaukee, Wisconsin, big, big, big supporter. Everything Dropkick Murphys does has to be made in America when it comes to American merchandise. It has to be American made, no exceptions. And uh, product shows up. We did all these samples with a soccer jersey made in Ohio, made in Ohio. Company brags about making it in Ohio. A thousand soccer jerseys show up to Milwaukee made in Pakistan. And I wasn't there to do this, but one of our guys was there. He was from Boston. So he, and he knew the crew and he knew a couple of guys in the band. And I just, I, I have to think that that's what led to him quitting. Pete, if you're listening to this, you should text me and tell me if this was one of the things that led you to quit Kings Road. Uh-huh. He had to sit behind in the storage room of this because they played the hockey arena in Milwaukee because it was a part of the, the show. Mm-hmm. tearing out made in Pakistan tags. Mm-hmm. So he's there. And it was a vendor who pulled the fast one on us, um, pulling out these made in Pakistan tags. Keep in mind, we're on a six month contract. This is yeah. our first two merch deliveries. Both have something like, I mean, the, the delivery skip, like that's <laughs> something that happens. But the made in Pakistan thing is like, you've got to be fucking kidding me. Yeah. And so having gone through that experience and then Also having moments of just honest mistake, you know, Uh, and if not for nothing, those guys don't suffer bullshit. Ken doesn't suffer bullshit. So if you make a mistake and you tell them, here's what happened, here's why it happened, here's how it's being prevented, he respects that, you know, and uh, going through that and not getting fired, I still don't understand it to this day. I, I, you know what I mean? Like we're a small company. We had been an independent company for seven months at the time, and your your made in USA soccer jersey show up made in Pakistan. You got to be joking! Like what a clown car! But over time, they learned to they learned what else we brought to the table, and it worked out fine. So, again, that was a moment where there could have been a fight. I could have I could have been very defensive, but it doesn't matter. I screwed up. I didn't screw up directly. I screwed up indirectly, but I still screwed up. And that's where navigating that like that little moment applies to so much other stuff that what's it really worth you know is it worth resolving or is it worth creating a battle oh yeah awesome man all right so as we're wrapping up i'm going to ask you three questions uh the first is what are you up to now um musically well since moving back to minneapolis i mean it hasn't been as active for the last six months just due to life and work and everything else but uh i have been playing and i played in a couple bands uh, we did do a Andy Kaufman style holding on reunion, uh, with Dillinger four. We played as a band called edge break, where we were the only straight edge band to ever play a Dillinger 4th of July. And all of us were formerly straight edge, but we only <laughs> played straight edge. So we played like chain of strength, judge, awesome. uh, project X, you know, we played all the hits. Well done. And, uh, well done. It was, it was fun. It was great. We spent our entire guarantee making a backdrop. It was really <laughs> smart business. <laughs> um, and then, uh, <laughs> <laughs> we played one show with Holding On as uh, with Sick of It All uh, at, as a part of a beer release in Minneapolis because Armin is a big beer guy and became friends with the head brewer and the head brewer was a part of the Holding On world in the early days. So we did that. And then uh, that experience, just getting back in, playing, getting drums set up. Um, Matt, who sings for the band that I'm in now, Desperate Axe, he used to be in Comeback Kid. So he was in Comeback Kid for, I think, five or six years, quit to focus on life at home and just realized he wasn't cut out for touring that way. And he played in edge break with us, but even then he thought he was never going to play in a band. Mm-hmm. And so even just going through like, it's a very dumb start to a band, mm-hmm. but you realize like, Hey man, like it's kind of fun to play music. And uh, we've been through this. We've tried to do it. So now we just do it as a hobby. And so 
we're just writing some songs and he had a couple things that we tried to do a hardcore band for a while and we both realized like ah, we're just not really cut out for this anymore like we're not we're not able to do this anymore in a way that that we would want it to be like we can't do this at a quality level anymore yeah, yeah. and he's like oh, i have some other parts from these other songs that i wrote and they were awesome yeah. and so we just started building that up and then we were writing for a while and then we were going to record a record record an lp just on our own just to document it and then the pandemic kicked in and then we just went into hermit mode and we started practicing i mean we just had time you know we had time and our wives trusted us so we were we set up a practice space. We wore double masks the whole time. For the first couple months, he was facing into one corner. I set up my drums facing another corner. Then when our, the other member came in, he was facing into a different corner. And we just was like, we did whatever we could to make it work. And um, our band Desperate Acts has a record that came out last fall on a label from Austria called Spam. And then Revelation helped put it out here. And it's just, it's something for us because it's like that stuff never leaves your body, man. It just never right. does, you know, All right. even Where if can... you haven't played guitar or drums, it just All never right. goes away. I try, I try to play guitar as little as possible um, for, I do that for the guitars and then also for, for myself. Singing. Yeah. Well, um, where can people find Desperate Acts? It's on, it's everywhere. I mean, it's on iTunes, it's on Spotify. Uh, there's records available mm -hmm. from Spam and Rev and our store and, you know, it's the thing about music now it's everywhere so yeah. it's there for people um All right. you know it, it exists and we're we just it's been so it is a hobby that we care a lot about you know oh, yeah. what i mean um but All right. still that the stuff never leaves your body no way no way forever forever all right second to last question this is terrible terrible question i'm sorry Top three Minneapolis-based punk or hardcore bands, the absolute best of the best. What are your top three? Punk Patrick, or right bands? now. Patrick is sitting uh, across from me. He's he he looks thoughtful right now. He's got some opinions. So punk or hardcore, Minneapolis, top three. Best ever. Uh, you gotta go, you gotta go with who's for you, number one. Okay. I know oh. that okay. that this is this is where like I think that they never they they aren't appreciated not that people overrate or underrate them but they are properly rated okay like that's a weird way like they're not over overhyped and they're not underhyped people know they're good but it's just like it's a weird middle ground mm -hmm. where they're so I, I feel like they have so much in common with fugazi in terms of you can try to sound like that but you're never going to sound like that you're yeah. only going to have an influence of that it's just so unique like yeah. the melodies and, and what they were doing and also they were already touring playing hardcore shows when uh, DYS was recording. So they predate Exclaim. So mm -hmm. people from Boston always love hearing that when they're super Boston hardcore pride, where it's like, eh, who's who was already doing that, man? They did backup vocals on they did backup vocals on Brotherhood, I think. So they were already out there. Um, All right. So we got so who's Kurdu. Who's Kurdu? Mm -hmm. And then you gotta go Dylan your floor. You just have to. Like okay. they uh, they were Patrick just, Patrick agrees. He's he's shaking his head, yes. Okay. They were and still are like so unique and they were, they never want, they never took themselves as seriously as they could have or should have. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe that's why they can still play shows now and have fun doing it. But I mean, they made a very deliberate decision. They had a chance to sign to Epitaph and be like a real, try to make it, try to be a real band mm -hmm. or sign to Fat. And they knew at the time the band had to talk about it and they signed to Fat and they're still here. And they're, they were so important to Minneapolis um, because they, were a part of that scene in that mid nineties world. And then, you know, they went and did things far beyond what any band from Minneapolis in that era had ever done, you know, it was, and then still do. And they did it on their terms and they weren't afraid to tell people to fuck off. I mean, they still aren't, mm -hmm. but it's so, and they're so talented and creative. So mm -hmm. it's not just like the idea of them was awesome, but I mean, the music, it's still, they're still great. So, um, and then I would have to say for me, like Man Afraid was a band that just, they, they, they synced up all these things at one time, you know, mm -hmm. like the melody, they're pretty deeply melodic and, and it kind of snuck up on you. The lyrics are still pretty unparalleled and it's crazy how poignant they still are. Um, so those three are pretty fundamental. I mean, there's a lot of like little subs, you know, you can give honorable mentions to like blind approach um you know there's some bands like that that have like cool stories but all the cool stuff they did went on later mm -hmm. but i would say like those three i mean it's hard to it's hard to create a list without them so they, I, do, I, i'm asking a hard question 
All right. Patrick, how do you feel about that? That was a good answer. I thought he was going to say replacement. And how do you feel about that? That's good. I like the replacements. I, I wish you could see Patrick's body language right now. He's the replacements really replacements are a rock band. They're not a punk band. Okay. I'm not I'm not even gonna get I'm not even getting into this debate. I'll just say great list. Group, Carl, thank a, you. Amazing. All right. Fi- okay, final question. Final question. Yeah. Just final. Let's get let's get to it. Um, all right. What's next for you? What's next for King's Road? And then anything that you want to hype up or talk about as we're closing off? Oh, uh, what's next for me is just staying sane as we navigate every single fucking band on the planet be on tour at the exact same time everywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, it's like one of those, be careful what you wish for. (laughs) And now it's just, uh, it's just, it's been a pretty brutal, (laughs) not brutal because I mean, we're hanging in there just fine, Mm -hmm. but just getting through to Christmas. um, Mm -hmm. That's, that's the mode right now. And I know there's a lot of people in our, in the music world who are feeling the same way. Mm -hmm. Um, it's 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 a gate crash and everybody's coming back mm-hmm. so getting back to some normal level will be very nice and i think 2024 but uh you know one day at a time um for me it's just staying on man keep going try to stay creative so i don't you know get totally sucked into this myopic world of just always working mm-hmm. um and just you know things are going pretty good so keep things going well and that's really the focus, you know, stay, stay afloat and stay positive and stay sane. And I think, uh, try not to get caught up in the negative and then play some shows, you know, um, it's, uh, it's still fun to, to get out there and play. And even if it's just a bunch of dudes that are 40 in a punk band playing, like, fuck it, we're, we're going to do it for ourselves in a practice space. So why not do it with some friends that are hanging out at the same time? Hell yeah, man. All right. Well, um, I will be out there in June, so I'll make sure to get a hold of you before I come out and uh, hopefully we'll nice. be able to hang. Yeah. I'd love to, I'd love to hang out and meet your family. All right, uh, dude, thank you so much. Any last words before we close off? No, nah, thanks for doing this, man. Um, I know it went kind of long, but like it's uh, it is exciting because it is, it's cool to have you in that same boat of, you know, you can still, you can still chat with the young kids about hardcore if you had to, you know what I mean? You can still, you can still dust those, you can still dust those boots off every once in a while. And uh, it's still like, I, I have no regrets about being a focused parent. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's fun. Like we get older, it's cool. But you know, every once in a while, it's like still put on age of coral and you're like, Fuck, man, it's tough. like totally. it, it doesn't let, they don't cook like this anymore. You know? Hell yeah. All right. Well, listen, man, you are awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, Super proud of you. Really happy for all your success. And everyone, we'll see you in the outro. Spencer, drop the beat.